turn server going on that's what i could find out so just just say thanks for the feedback turn server going on. just say Problem. It's nice to track it. I think you're missing Philippe. Nice ah, okay. Sorry for for the whole loopback thing. That was me. Hello. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Hey. Greetings to Greece. Oh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> so, how are you doing? It's a shame they don't meet you personally. Mm. But what can we do? Okay, my side, everything's working. So I just roam around outside of the tablet. Uh, that's okay. Oh, Felipe, come as I. I do. Okay, I spare some bandwidth there. Okay. Oh yes, I see. Oh, Pedro. Oh, hi, Pedro. How are you doing? Fine, and you? Uh, thank you. I it remind you remind me from a very famous uh, Spanish uh, chess player who makes all the time. He makes online chess. He makes something. Ra -ta 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 -ta. Do you know him? No, no. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Dango. Dango the Chenko. <laughs> so, so how are you going? Okay. Yeah, fine. All good. Thanks. Yeah. To, yeah. to the other side of Europe. I'm in Portugal. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, happily, it's not that bad. It's, uh, uh, yeah, the virus is not that bad and the weather is not that bad. So, uh, we yeah, have similar, it. similar here. Yeah. The weather is not that bad and the virus, okay. I mean, I'm not yeah. affected. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I still struggle with the technique here. I did like to change the system, but it's not that simple. Uh, so, got to try to find it. Okay, okay. So, time. Time out. I'm off. Okay. So, switch off. See you later. See you. See you. Can you listen now better without noises? Nice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is so, Janosch already around? He just sent an email, so he can't be far away. Ah, yeah, he's on the he, uh, he's in the participants list already. 
Cool. Okay. Shall we start? Like officially now? Felipe, are you the presenter? Yeah, I can be. Maybe you can uh, remember again the, that we are broadcasting on YouTube. So if you don't like to be online or something that shouldn't be presented, just tell us or just you can you can re remove your webcam and we can start we can we can we can suspend the streaming if you'd like um so thank you all for being here again today and for all of the other organizers that were involved in this session so this is the start of day two let me just clear okay so for the the ones that couldn't attend yesterday this is just a quick reminder of how we ended up here in Big Blue Button and not in, in person. So this is a fully virtual battle mesh uh, for the first time, and I hope it's the the only time that we are going to be fully virtual. So we ended ended up in deciding to try to make to still make battle mesh this year, even if it's a short event, you know, two afternoons, uh, to be able to at least join us together a couple of hours. So we ended up in a two days uh, with with presentations. The wiki has changed slightly from from yesterday to today. So I I will show the the updated schedule in in a while. So we have multiple ways of participating in, in this event. We have this big blue button session. You you can join us and make some questions to the presenters, and the idea is to have some interaction between us. We also have the YouTube streaming, uh, where you can just watch, and, and there you can make some questions there. But maybe it's easier to to make to make here if possible. We also have a small room, so after the presentation, if you'd like to join for uh, a discussion on on the topic, you can join the a small Jitsi Jitsi room. The link is on on the wiki page as well. We also have the the matrix and the IRC. Um, if you want to raise some questions. So basically, we are a little bit tight on, on schedule, so we advise people to, to, to ask the questions at the end, at the end of the, the talk. And if you'd like to put some questions, just raise your, um, raise your hand or just, uh, just make uh, this, oops, yeah, this sign, the exclamation mark. Um, so for today, so this was the schedule for yesterday, and today we are a little bit uh, updated on lightning talks. So we had a free slot yesterday, uh, and Claudia will make a, a presentation. So we have a full afternoon, and the idea is to have small breaks in between the, the talks. Mm. So maybe we can try to, to to be a little bit short on time of, of on the talk so that we can have like a five minute break for a coffee or or some, some other discussion offline. So again, thank you for all of the endorsers to make this, this uh, announcement more open and also for uh, Giffinet and Exo for hosting this Big Blue Button server, which is working fine. Uh, yesterday we had 50 people without any break, so good work. <laughs> so thanks for, for hosting this. And yeah, so, and finally, thank you for the organizers and you all for attending. So let's the battle begin. <laughs> So this is the schedule for today. We are we have ten minutes uh, for for the next presenter. I don't know if you want to to Just open the floor for some other topic in between. One question to the schedule. Um, now we have thirty minutes and four lightning talks, right? Mm -hmm. May, does it sort of? Uh, if, if if those lightning talks take a little bit long, is it okay for for Nishant? Is Nishant here? I don't know. If you just sort of extend a little bit, if 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 you need it. Perhaps we can have the next talk right now. So we have these ten minutes uh, for the lightning talks. 
So we shift the whole schedule a little bit. Is that okay? That's okay. That, yes. Is that okay for the other speakers? Not all of them are here, but they are scheduled to uh, to show up uh, a few minutes in advance, so we can catch them and ask them if they're fine. And Janos is here already, um, so maybe he would like to speak up and say whether he'd like to start right away. You. So you're the presenter now, Janos. Let me just switch to his slide deck. Maybe he's gone shortly AFK. He'd be very happy to return right into his talk. Yeah. that he mentioned he would be going away for 10 minutes. Um, I guess soon. Ah, no, we started an earlier presentation um, so that we um, make up enough room or number of talks that has accumulated so far. Um, so if you are ready, then I would hand over moderation rights to you in an instant. And just a quick reply to Tango WRT. Um, he asked, I suppose screen sharing is possible for the presentation, just like it was Friday on test instance, right? Uh, yes, in general, screen sharing is possible. Um, if you can avoid it, uh, we are happy because it saves some bandwidth on the server side and it also saves some CPU cycles on the clients. Um, but if you have animations or anything complicated going on or uh, want to show something in your browser, anything like that, then you're free to screen share. OK. Uh, hope that answered the question. Janos, can you hear us? Yes, you can hear us. Uh, say something. Hi, I'm Janos, and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, no, that's the wrong group. Uh, sorry about that. I'm not an alcoholic, and I'm not supposed to say my name then. But anyway, <laughs> it's not an AA meeting, I guess. Hello, Janos. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah. folks. Thanks for coming. Uh, so your your presentation is ready, and I'll hand you the moderation rights in a sec. Yeah. So you should get these uh, these controls uh, to the right of the presentation slides. Oops, was that the wrong Janos that I made the moderate uh, the presenter now? Sorry for that. Uh, it looks fine. Uh, I'm just missing the whiteboard controls. Is it uh, disabled? Ah, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. That's okay. perfect. Well, it uh, has been a while since I attended the battle match uh, a few years ago. I think it was about two years ago, but I'm not sure about this. So, well, it's an unusual uh, situation. I'll try to do my very best. So, in case you have any questions, you can. Uh, I think it's it's best if you signal this using the uh, well. <laughs> uh, microphone or so because I'm have a hard time following the chat because there's so much uh, uh, chopper going on there and it uh, I'd be the case but I just overlook it so just just try to read aloud for instance um, today I'm I'm going to present or at least I'm finished with my master thesis nowadays I Yes, I've spoken to some of you in, in the past about uh, possible subjects. Uh, so, um, but I think it's it's a good wrap up actually to, to explain or to to tell you what I was uh, about to do in this uh, thesis. Um, I'd like to to make two propositions in the beginning because. Um, it's basically to avoid misunderstandings. One is the definition of a mesh network, and uh, in my opinion, a mesh is a network topology following no predefined structural pattern. 
So this definition is somewhat independent of the actual technology in use, of the protocols in use, whether it's a wired or a wireless uh, mesh network, it, it just refers to a network topology. Uh, the second thing is I like to make is when I talk about software-defined networking, I refer to RFC 7246. And this introduces uh, SDN as a paradigm focusing on a programmable forwarding plane. That is separating control from forwarding functionality. I think SDN or software-defined networking has somewhat evolved into a marketing term um, in in the last years and a lot of vendors claim that their equipment or that their implementation is able to do software defined networking but um this is kind of a loose uh, description in my opinion and, and i um personally like to stick to the rc definition so much for the preposition let's uh, talk a little bit about the uh yeah how days again, uh, there's um, about two parts of my talk. One is, the, or, or part one is about uh, getting a master's degree by playing with an old Playmobil toy train. And part two is how this could be relevant for wireless community mesh networks. Okay, let's go. I decided to get a master's degree in computer science. Finally, I've, I, well, I was studying I almost said that I have been studying, but I'm not studying anymore computer science for a few years, and I decided to finish. So how to do this? Um, basically, I'm trying to implement a train-to-ground backhaul network using Wi-Fi or IEEE 802.11, and you have a train that moves along the track, and you have a few access points, AP1, AP2, and IPSR or whatsoever. And as the train moves along the track, the data for the train has to be switched to AP1, AP2, and so forth. And the hypothesis was seamless uh, horizontal soft handovers in an ACDN based IEEE 802.11 train to ground backhaul provide capacity and latency suitable for internet provisioning inside the running train. So the actual challenge is to have uh, uninterrupted communication, which is basically a horizontal soft handover. You're in the same network, hence it's a horizontal handover, and soft means it's not a hard cut. You hand over without losing connectivities. Um, as of now, IEEE 802.11 lacks soft handover capabilities. There are a few roaming extensions there, but um, it's a break before make scheme, meaning that you establish a uh, link to an upcoming access point uh, before, um, or, um, after you cease connectivity to the previous ones. And unfortunately, typical mesh protocols are not able to handle with the mobility of the train. They are slow. Um, they need a few seconds typically to converge and the train only has a few milliseconds to perform the handover. One could argue in principle, if it's, is it actually feasible? Is a wireless communication possible in that domain? Is it a sane argument? At first, it's not the focus of my master thesis, or it was not the focus of my master thesis. There are a few reasons highlighting the possibility. There has been a um, practical experiment in the 2.4 gigahertz band by Yakabo Moto, who uh, actually built a real-world system for the, the Japanese uh, Shikansen, which is a high-speed train in Japan. Um, but there's just a proof of concept for a very short track, and they didn't implement any handovers. There is a train control-based uh, train to go on backhaul, which is in, uh, sold by a Berlin-based company called Niantec and um, developed um, together there with uh, Siemens AS, which is in Denmark, and the Dansk Technologiske Universität uh, in Copenhagen. Um, and, well, train control system is a very different domain. You can have 
broadcast traffic all over the place because you don't need to transmit so much data. You are probably a few kilobits per second because you need to do signaling based on classical light signals. And this is not even close to the range uh, internet provisioning takes place. And well, if I, uh, as what I said before, one idea of this uh, question is to implement this handover using software-defined networking, which is um, reusing an existing programmable com control plane in order to switch. It's not about implementing a full-blown protocol, but to reuse existing components and to judge about the uh, implied complexity on this approach. And as I try to line out during my talk, the research uh, on wireless existing reusable control planes or wireless SDN is ongoing. So uh, unlike in the wired world where, for example, Google or YouTube is using an open flow based so-called espresso BGP peering edge for uh, load, uh, for for quality of service, so we have remote turbo balancing. It's not that common in the wireless world as of now. So how to do this? Uh, one idea is um, to hand over based on the position of the train and to use a front and a rear radio doing so. There's a lot of uh, related work on that domain. Um, I will spare you with the details, but in essence, um, during the introduction of high-speed rails in China, there were a lot of works mostly dating from 2000 to 2015 and most of these works um, they were proposing modification for cellular networks like um, using or coordinating two cellular uplinks or um, handing over based on the position and it's easy to to do this uh, with uh, software defined networking as well of course, there are some other ideas that cannot be translated to the wireless domain, for example. The moving cell or fre uh, moving frequency scheme where the um, train um, has certain frequency which is used all the time and the track switches. That's just not possible because you have the ISM band and you have, uh, for example, interference on some Wi Fi channels at some locations. And if you are going to use all over the same, and if you're going to use the same frequency all over the journey, then you run into places where the frequency is just a bad choice. Of course, radio over fiber, we are not uh, having OZ1 protocols for Wi-Fi. It's a cellular thing. Leaky cable in the gigahertz band is really expensive. Um, I'm not even sure if it's possible for large <laughs> distance, uh, but it is insanely expensive then. And satellites, they just do not provide enough capacity. So. The general idea based on related work is to have a position-based handover and to have a dual radio-based handover. Um, you can, for instance, look at other works on wireless software-defined mesh networks, um, which are uh, trying to implement handovers. And in related work, this problem is actually twofold. It refers to client mobility and uh, to wireless mesh topology changes. In client mobility, you have, hmm? yes? Nishant? Is there a question? Nishant, in case you have a question, just speak up. Otherwise, I'd, yeah, thanks for muting. Thank you. OK. Uh, then I go on. So for uh, client mobility, uh, the general hypothesis is that you want to optimize an uh, campus network using software-defined networking, and you want to implement seamless handovers, for example, in a campus network. And you try to use the reusable control plane to steer traffic to the corresponding access point. Um, these approaches try to implement wireless protocols in the control plane. So they re-implement, for example, uh, roaming extensions or encryption functionality. Unfortunately, this is like a uh, rather challenging overhead. So um, you lose some performance. 
and it's quite complex. First, you need to have a control, uh, controller implementing wireless protocols. And it's not so easy to implement that. So you can go that way, but it's not like an intuitive choice. On the other hand, you could argue that you use a wireless uh, mesh network, which is the train is not a client to the infrastructure, but is a part of the SDN control network. Uh, but nowadays, most uh, SDN um, uh, approaches for topology and mesh networks somewhat assume a over ad hoc network based protocol, for example, OLSR or 802.11s for topology discovery, which is, uh, as I said before, is not able to converge to the high speed of the running train. Um, yeah. So indeed, there are some some works on on implementing software-defined train-to-go vertical network based on 802.11. Um, there are some shortcomings. For the first one, they implemented a train control system which just duplicates packets along Wi-Fi and a cellular network to increase reliability. And the second one is actually really close to what I was proposing in my master thesis. And the idea was also to, to have this for internet provisioning. Uh, unfortunately, there are also a little bit shortcomings like they don't support uh, IPv6. They don't rely completely on a programmable control plane. They use custom protocols. They do network address translation and tunneling. They exclude uh, trains of certain sizes practically excluding almost all high-speed trains come to Europe, and they provide only average performance values. So much for related work. The general idea is sound, and I don't like to dig into the details. Let's get to the fun part. Um, so what I was doing was to implement a uh, SDN application, and I'm trying to, to explain this in the terminology of RFC 7246. And, and as I said before, the um, general idea behind um, SDN is to have a reusable control plane. So you have this kind of control plane, which uh, utilizes the forwarding plane of the device. And the left-hand side is uh, for handling individual packets of flows. It's not for device configuration. For, for device configuration, you have the right-hand side. So here is, uh, for instance, SSH and Ansible and Chef and Puppet, which is device provisioning, which is in charge of configuring the wireless interface. U2 uh, SDN is to have a separated control plane running as a centralized entity, which controls uh, the forwarding plane. And for my system, I wrote the handover application in Python using RU, which is an SDN controller and a reusable library and using OpenFlow on the control plane. It was possible due to using Open vSwitch, which is an open source uh, software switch in the forwarding plane. And since I was focusing on uh, SDN and not on a real world uh, program, I was focusing on research prototype. I had a static inventory on the management plane, which is basically JSON files describing which access points were out there, a small Python script for um, associating the radios with the um, certain interfaces, and I was relying on Linux command line utilities. Uh, positioning data was like in a control, train control system mock over MQTT. Um, so you could argue what's actually the benefit of having a reusable control plane in that scenario, and it's quite straightforward to associate Wi-Fi based on positioning data, because you just have a Python script getting positioning data. But if you have two links yeah. operating in I for free, any questions? Oh, OK, none. <laughs> but having two links operating in parallel, it's um, somewhat hard. You have to avoid loops. You have to switch a certain link um, on the network. And yeah, you can do using SDN. OK, that's my train. <laughs> you see there are two small pocket routers in the front and in the rear end of the train. And there's a Raspberry Pi uh, on that train. 
and it was just moving back and back and forth. And then here you see that all equipment is powered up by power banks, so that you actually have a running train and a running research prototype. Okay, so far, that sounds no questions. Here, let's have a short look on the track. There were a few through beam systems for monitoring the train positioning. We, uh, there was a small wall for shadowing one access point and there are two access points um, over there. And, I, and I'll try to, to show you actually an onboard video of the train in a, uh, in a second when I am used to big blue button. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you see that the train is going, you see the different Wi-Fi access points and, and you see how the system is running there and you can see that the video is uh, streamed without any interruption from the train. Yeah, and here we have the handover. That's it. <laughs> okay, so much for the video. Um, it's it's all on YouTube. I can I can send you the link in the channel. So if there's any any problem displaying the video, it should be fixed right now. And and the network model is really simple because you just have a re and a front radio and an AP2 and AP AP1 and AP2, and you have an open flow enabled gateway which switches uh, flows from one to another. Any questions so far? No questions. Mm. Either you are bored or you are lost. I don't know. Well, I'll just go on <laughs> and see if we can have a vital discussion in the end. There are only praises on the chat so far. Awesome. Ah, that's fine. Okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, the the code is available uh, on open source um, on GitFS Lab Day. I'll give you the link again, and I don't know if if it's uh, possible to have uh, copy and paste uh, out of the, the presentation. Oh, here we go. So if you're interested in the source code, you can just go there and same holds for YouTube. So that's quite an unusual way to get a master's degree in computer science, but uh, we are, let's say, um, community focusing on um, so on, on wireless mesh networks. And as I said before, uh, trains have a really, really static structure. You have uh, track side and train side equipment. And this is usually not what you have in a mesh. As I said before, a mesh is understood, or, I, or at least I understand a mesh to follow an all predefined structure or pattern. Um, but how do this, is it is there a way for software-defined wireless mesh networks? Is it a serious combination? And of course, the idea of a centralized control is a very challenging assumption in a mesh network. Um, for instance, uh, if you have a non-distributed setup and you have just a single SDN controller and you have wireless links starting and ceasing to exist, it, it, it's quite likely that um, certain nodes lose connectivity. Of course, you can go for a distributed setup and have a Raspberry Pi using a controller besides every access point, but it's also the question on, on how does it scale. And the idea of, of having a global view on the network was actually discarded when um, initiating Batman in, in the first place. And there's a really nice article by Elektra called the OLSR.org story in the wiki. Still, should somewhat have a mind the mesh network is not necessarily based on mobile ad hoc networks. Um, so there's certain, let's say, difference because you don't have mobility in the network. And indeed, there is a commercial of the Chef uh, Wireless Backhaul Network, which is called YBAC. It's a closed source network developed by Fraunhofer FET, um, which is comprised of directed IEEE 802.11 based links. And they say it's 
so for connecting the unconnected for rural areas in Africa and so ever, but unfortunately it's closed source and there's not much to tinker. However, one could argue if we have like Open vSwitch and Open WRT and it's uh, possible to, to have a certain train handover scenario, we are almost there. And essentially this Y-Bank networks just provide a nice user interface and that's it. there is not much more from component side. Of course, there are algorithms, there's a program solution, but it's not magic anymore. So how could actually an, an SDN help in an uh, ILS community network? And when you look at related work or when you think about what you can do, one, one idea, people usually have the load balancing. It's fast failover, which is improving the convergence as for the train. Also prototyping of new mesh protocols. I know some people who are interested in building their own uh, protocols. Actually, this is one of the first ideas for OpenFlow. When OpenFlow was designed, it was in the research world and they were interested in uh, benchmarking or trying different mesh protocols. So this was like a real world test framework for routing protocols. Um, and if you try to generalize this, the option is actually to adapt to a local environment. As I said before, a mesh doesn't follow a predefined network structure. So there's no global structure you can rely on, but locally, maybe you have two links in a parallel and you want to consider load balancing among them. And there's research on, on that as well. There was a nice survey by one of my supervisors called Michael Rademacher. It's a state-of-the-art survey on software-defined wireless mesh networking, current changes and challenges. And he identified some, some challenges like wireless interface, configuration, component, control plane connection, and topology discovery, routing and load balancing, modulation, encoding, and client handling as challenges to combine wireless uh, mesh networks and SDN. And you see there are a few works, but most of them is just experimenting and load balancing prototype. There's just one which is this YBAC um, system, which is not using OpenFlow or OFS for using OpenFlow, which is actually a working um, system out there. So to summarize, um, it's fun setting up a simple SDN uh, using a model train. OpenWRT has batteries included when it comes so far. You have Open vSwitch for a forwarding plane. Um, you have, yeah, it is Lego. There's actually a laser tech. Course, this is a class one laser device. It's legal with lasers. I think that is even more awesome. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> well, the train is Playmobil and the uh, control system is legal. So OpenWRT has batteries included. Uh, this is especially also for vSwitch, which is a really nice Linux soft switch, really good performing one. You have Wii as an OpenFlow SCN controller, which is quite lightweight and can easily extend it using Python. Um, one word of warning, do not control a full mesh, uh, a full Python mesh by an almighty administration team. Well, that's not decentralization anymore running an SDN controller, but still you can use an SDN to kind of in-band exploit a local structure or pattern which is not existing in the phone uh, mesh network. And in the end, it's a challenging subject and there will be dragons. Okay, that's from my side. I hope that was not too much in, in a very few minutes. Are there any questions so far? Thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question regarding your your experience about traffic flow. If you make recommendations for building such a solution as your solution for other networks, uh, what kind of, um, is there an opportunistic approach by directing traffic or should everything be measured? So what is your, your, your guideline? If you, somebody wants to develop such an idea, is it more, more and more measuring? Is it more opportunistic? What's the direction you would uh, consider heading? 
Well, when it comes to load balancing, it's it's a really difficult research topic and there's a lot of work out there. And even in the related work domain I was mentioning, or which was here on the, um, mentioned in Michael's survey, uh, basically all proposals uh, you made before uh, are there. My personal opinion is just just try to exploit local properties. So for instance, when you have a five home community mesh network and you try to to run a site, uh, for instance, at an, as an event and you have to load balance uh, across two DSL lines or so, then just write a small application actually implementing this kind of load balancing. Because I don't think it's it's a good idea to reuse this kind of SDN software. Of course, there's the idea of a universal network management program which can be used in a lot of uh, situations and they have a full-blown SDN controller which even implement routing protocols for pushing and propagating forwarding rules, but things will be very complex in there. So um, I think it's the easiest thing if you just write some uh, Python code really uh, which suits your situation. For example, the whole system I was proposing has less than 1,000 lines of Python code. So it's, it isn't much and uh, try to, to adapt to your local situation. Uh, here's TX question. How did you manage to separate the piece and force sent over with the train? Seems like challenging to do in such a small scale. Yes, it is. Uh, it's a five gigahertz setup. Uh, there's a concrete and load bearing wall in between, which actually shadows this, but um, to be honest, you you have a small Python agent running on the train, which associates to different access points based on positioning data. So in order to evaluate the system, you're not required to lose connectivity. And um, actually using positioning data is like a counter approach for um, relying on RSSI, which is on single strength measurements. And typically, uh, I haven't talked much about the channel on a train, but uh, yeah, certain train related phenomena like tunnels or the uh, Doppler delay shift make the channel quite unreliable and make RSSI measurements quite unreliable on a train. So there's uh, some, some related work proposing um, a location-based scheme uh, instead. Um, uh, Sorry to yeah. interrupt you. Can I just take presenter from you and upload slides for the next speaker? You can answer yeah, a couple for sure. more questions. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other questions so far? Right, one question. Can you explain it in more detail? How this, uh, so you now said uh, that it's, uh, you switch the access point based on the position. So it's, this is lasers you detected probably the position or and then switch just and what does the, so how is the process of the switching actually working? Uh, in the well, that's a side thing. Usually it's the, the general assumption is that you have a train control system in place and positioning data is used for interlocking and train control. So it's quite there in that domain. And I just decided to rely on the existence of us uh, in the need for implementing some some kind of prototype stylish mock. And, and in that situation, I decided to, to go for MQTT, which was also used in related work and it's just one more general telemetry protocol. Uh, so, well, um, I had the through beam systems which were um, connected to Raspberry Pi and whenever the train passes the through beam systems, they were able to measure the speed and the position. They encoded this in JSON, published this on a MQTT. And on, on, on the train side, uh, on the OpenWRT routers, there was a small Python script just uh, subscribing to the MQTT channel. And whenever an update uh, was received, it called IW for switching to the new access point. Okay, thank you. It's not an optimal way. <laughs> it was just motivated by having a rather minimal prototype. Uh, 
other questions or shall we go on? I think there's still a problem with the slides. Oh, okay. Um, I'm in contact with the speakers on the IRC channel, so you can possibly all read what uh, what he's typing and he just said he'll share the screen. So mm -hmm. we'll not use the uploaded slides, but just share the screen instead. Well, if there are no further questions, I think we can uh, go on. I'll be around for a little while. You can drop me a mail if you have any questions, but in the end, I think we are finished. Well, there's one Tango WRT typing. Mm. He has stopped typing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Very, very nice thing. Uh, and congratulations again on, on finishing your studies. <laughs> and can you put the, your link to your master thesis because it talks about this in higher detail, maybe? And it would be nice. Uh, well, it's not available at the moment. I'm in discussion with my university to publish the, the thesis or a part of the thesis as a research uh, document. I think that things are, will be settled by the end of this year, but uh, for the moment you have to stick to the source code <laughs> or so. Maybe later we can update the, the presentation with that link. Uh, yeah, most probably it's just like when you when you want to publish something on ACM or so, you have to sign that this is uh, unpublished work so far. And if I decide to publish my master the thesis beforehand, I cannot sign that anymore, and I cannot publish anything. So that's a little bit annoying, but it, mm, it but, is that way. But I think that there's a line between publishing and publishing, like making it available to the community is something different than um, publishing in it. Well, same conference at say I'll send this on request. My university explicitly advised, advised me not to publish the master thesis before uh, discarding the idea or, or fulfilling the idea of offering a, a separate publication. And when this is settled, they will actually assign a document identifier to my master thesis. So most probably it will be published at some point in time. But my supervisors say, hey, it's a good idea not to do so beforehand, then I'll just go that way. So but okay. Got if, it. if yes. somebody asks, I just send them my master thesis and pretend I didn't do so. So the, all the, right. Oh, wait, there's, there's, there's no recording. way to uh, Sorry, can you can you cut out this of the recording? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little bit strange. Maybe we we just stop you now. I go and mute you so that you that you don't say things that you shouldn't say. Uh, yeah, and we'll true. we'll hand over uh, to uh, Sauron, shall we? Well, right. technically, if I just publish it individually, it's not publishing on a global scale. So I could still sign that letter. Yeah, most probably. <laughs> okay, hand over. Thank you very much, Janos. And uh, let's hear Baptiste. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Good. So let me start. And let's try this. It works. Yes. Okay, okay, so let's go. Uh, so I'm going to present um, how to build custom open your open WT images. And probably many of you already know some of what I will present. But at the end, I also um, I will also present some new ideas to improve things. So if things uh, seem to to be well known uh, at the beginning of the presentation, please wait until the end. So um, just a quick recap on Open OpenWRT uh, on a high level scale. Um, so OpenWRT is quite kind of special because it, uh, it has two main use cases. One which is to be used directly by end users. So you go to the website, you download a, an image for, for your device, you flash it, and then you can uh, configure things, install packages, install your BitTorrent client or whatever you want. And uh, that makes OpenUIT quite well known because it's, it's, it works, it's extensible, 
you can do many things with it, uh, and it supports a lot. It supports a lot of different devices. But there's also another side, um, which is to use OpenURT for what I call integrators. I don't like this word, but I did, didn't find anything better. And uh, the idea is that you can build OpenWRT images uh, that you customize, and then use these images to sell a product or to deploy it for a community network. So it's not a direct use case. It's a, it's a people building the image are different from people using the image at the end. And so it's, uh, it's less known as a feature, but it's really important. Um, and probably by the number of device, uh, this is much more, much bigger than the previous use case. Um, and the idea why, why it's interesting, uh, it's because if you want to build a custom system, you don't have to reinvent everything. You can use uh, the base open OpenWRT open system, the kernel, the device support, uh, everything, uh, and the tools to configure Wi-Fi and so on. And then you can focus on just your specific parts. So it's quite uh, interesting to, to save time. And there are other projects that uh, allow this, such as Yocto and Buildroot, uh, but uh, OpenWRT is more focused on the wireless side. And it's really this uh, special project that has both these uh, this use cases that makes it quite uh, quite interesting. But at the same time, it's uh, difficult to do both, of course. So uh, I'll cover how, so this second use case, so how to build your own um, custom OpenURT images. Uh, so the idea is that you build a, a single image or a single set of image that then you use for lots of devices. It's not just for your single home router, it's really for more large scale deployments. So we cover two approaches, which is uh, building your own image from, from source code and using the image builder. And I will focus mostly on the second part uh, because there are lots of tools to make it easier. And it was, this will be the main discussion. So the first approach uh, is quite straightforward. Uh, you take the source code of open, open WRT, you force you fork the kit tree, possibly the packages. Then you hack uh, stuff into the the tree. You add your custom changes, uh, add a nice web interface, whatever. And then you can build uh, images and distribute them. So then it's no longer really Open WRT, so you should find another name. And um, on the long on the long term, you you need to also synchronize with uh, upstream uh, because there are bug fixes and new features. So you, it's better if you if you get them. And also, it's a good idea to integrate your changes into Open OpenWRT uh, because if you don't so first, if you don't do that, uh, you will have a lot of differences and it's a nightmare to maintain. And also, it's a good idea to contribute back to the to the community. So uh, simple idea, but a bit of work. So it's quite good because you can, it's really flexible. You can add new devices, uh, remove some things you don't like, uh, add new system, uh, system demons if you want. You can do releases of your own image uh, anytime you want. You are not dependent on, uh, on open your release schedules. So, uh, really flexible, but it's a lot of maintenance work. And you also need a bit of infrastructure to, to build images and, and to distribute packages. So mostly for large scale um, things. So some example of projects that, that use this approach. So there are some community networks, of course. So I think the biggest one is uh, um, I guess it depends on the metric, but um, uh, Gluon is quite uh, well known in the open UAT community. And um, it's, it's interesting because uh, it's, a, it's a custom system. It does a lot of things that open UAT does not do, but they managed to keep a minimal number of custom patches. And uh, I checked this morning and they have like 20, pa 20 patches on top of open UAT. So they really try to upstream their, their changes and, and 
probably this helps to to maintain uh, to maintain the project. So it's a good uh, a good example, I think. Then there's this uh, amateur radio uh, kind of community network in the US that also has its own um, open URT fork. Then uh, there are also some, of course, some commercial or mm, less commercial products. And like this over the box system from uh, OVH, uh, open and PTCP router that does mostly the same thing. So they provide images that you can install on your home router. So mostly uh, high end uh, routers. And it will be able to aggregate uh, several internet connections using multipath TCP. And it will proxy all your connections over this multipath uh, system. And both are based on open URT. Uh, GLINet, which is a, a router vendor that has a, a custom fork of open URT with a nice web interface, VPN, and so on. And uh, I mean, there are probably uh, tens of or hundreds of uh, of downstream project that uh, fork open VRT. Some are open, some are not open. So it, it's um, for big actors, it's really uh, the main approach. So now the second um, approach. Uh, yes, somebody is mentioning tourists. It's a good, um, good idea, I forgot about them. Um, so yeah, tourists, they both uh, manufacture hardware and they provide their own uh, open URT based system on it. So now for the second approach, um, so this is actually the one we use in our community networks in, uh, in France. Uh, I will go back to why later. And the idea of the image builder, it's, uh, it's something provided by the open URT project. And it allows you to create uh, images without building any source code. So it takes just a few minutes on laptop. You don't need to install lots of things and so on. So it's uh, quite convenient. And basic idea, it takes a base system for a specific device. And you give it a bit of packages. And then it rebuilds a new image with these packages. And it generates you a, an image that you can flash on the device. So um, this allows a bit of customization. And you can also add or override files in the image uh, to, to do more customization. So the way it works, quite quickly, there is documentation, of course. Uh, so you download the image builder. It's available on the, on the download site of OpenVRT. You find the model you want to build an image for. So there is a make uh, info command. And then you have a command to build an image, and you can optionally pass a list of packages. You can remove packages if you don't have enough uh, storage space. Uh, and you can also add uh, files. Uh, I don't uh, show it here, but it's possible. So overall, it's, uh, it's been there for a long time. Uh, oops, sorry. Got a bit too quickly. So it's been there for a long time. Uh, it's not that well known, but uh, it's still uh, it's still a useful uh, useful tool. But then um, the problem we had in our in our nonprofit ISP um, is that we wanted to do more customization than just installing new pack uh, just instant packages uh, because we provide uh, routers to our members and we want them to be already configured with everything we want. So for instance, um, define a, an, an admin password, SH keys, custom configuration, configuration like uh, firewall, wireless, uh, possibly a VPN client. There are lots of things we want to do. And so this goes beyond just installing uh, packages in the image. So there is a, a simple solution, which is to to, since we can add files to the image, we can just add a configuration files so that we can pre-generate all the needed configuration and include it in the image. So of course, uh, if you do that, you need a template system, otherwise it's, uh, it would be a mess. 
So this approach is a bit, um, so it's simple, which is good. But then when there are changes in open URT, you need to update a bit your config possibly. And uh, configuration is, uh, is really specific to each uh, model. For instance, uh, the, network, the name of the network interface, the number of wireless interface, uh, everything can be a bit different depending on the model. So it's a bit of work to adapt for each new, new model. Uh, so there is another solution. Um, so I'm not saying it's better or worse, but uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to know both options. So it's called uh, UC defaults. It's, uh, it's part of uh, OpenURT. And the idea is that you can add uh, your own scripts uh, on the image. And these scripts, they will be run on the first boot of the device. And this allows you uh, directly on the device to look at the configuration. So as I said, it, it can be different depending on the model. And uh, you, so you can inspect this configuration, change it, so that you can apply all your custom uh, changes. So the nice thing about it is that uh, really it runs on the device while with the template system, uh, you need to do it uh, in advance. So you can't really adapt, uh, so you need, yeah. You can't really use the same configuration for several devices. While here, you could actually use a single script that, uh, that uh, adapts to the device. So there are um, some corner cases, uh, like when the user upgrades the router, the script will be run again, so you need to be careful. Uh, not to, to override the configuration of the user. And uh, it's nice, but it's, a, it's sometimes um, a bit hard to develop and hard to debug because you have to actually try on a device uh, or find uh, another way, but it's not really straightforward to be sure that uh, what you do is working well. And so I put a link to the, to the documentation. So, in my, um, to my knowledge, this, these are the two most um, widespread solutions to customize uh, OpenURT using the image builder. So some examples of uh, organizations that do that. So Tetentral is a, is a non-profit ISP in France, and they use the first approach with templates uh, in Python. Uh, so the uh, people from uh, Gwifi, Exocat, uh, they use sim a similar system but in, in Ruby. Uh, I think Pedro did a presentation about this uh, last year in Betonesh. So in Resin, which is my, uh, my community network, uh, we use UC defaults with some custom shell scripts. And actually, I'm not completely satisfied with this uh, system, so that's why I was uh, looking for other solutions. And then, uh, so Fry from Berlin, I haven't looked in depth uh, what they do, but they build a custom image builder. And then they use this image builder to quickly build uh, images. I'm not completely sure what they do to, to customize uh, afterwards. And then there's this uh, attended Cisco Bread project um, that basically uh, provides a, f uh, a backend that allows you to build custom images, and you can use it from an API or from a, a web client. And it, it provides the same functionality as the image builder. Uh, you can choose your model, choose some packages to install, and then you click uh, generate, and it, it, it uh, and then the backend uh, builds you an image and sends it to you. And I, I put a link to documentation that uh, describes all this, uh, these front ends. So an overview so far. Uh, so the two solutions are either maintaining your own OpenVRT tree, which is really flexible. You can do lots of things, but it needs resources and it's, uh, it's quite a lot of work to maintain. So you should do this uh, if you have enough resources, like people that, are, that can maintain this for several years, or if you do something really, really custom and cannot use just uh, the base OpenVRT. Open while well, the image builder, it's, uh, it's much more lightweight. Uh, you don't have anything to maintain. You just use uh, open WRT packages and so on. 
but uh, you are dependent on the on the release schedule. So if you need to patch something or, or add changes, you, you cannot easily. And customization is not that obvious. So it's possible, but it's a bit, um, uh, can be a bit difficult. So it's mostly suitable if you if you are close to the open UAT use case. So if you just want to give uh, wireless routers that do Wi-Fi and, and standard stuff, it's, uh, it's appropriate. So now, um, this was a presentation part, and now it's more of a discussion part. Because I, I wanted to improve the way we build images in my community network, and I'm not yet sure how we'll do it, but um, I want to share some ideas. So some areas that I think could be improved is uh, how to, to find the correct image builder, because there's an image builder for each uh, hardware target and each version of OpenURT. So each project has a bit of, uh, of code to, to get the right, uh, the right image builder, validate it, extract it, and so on. So this is probably something where there could be some common, uh, common tools or something. And then uh, what I call profile management, which I will describe just after. So uh, the idea is that we all have a system to describe some profiles uh, about which device we are supporting, which customization you want to do, which version of OpenURT works well on the device or not. And um, maybe we could build a command tool or something. So this is really uh, at the design stage for now. So this is an example of profile. Uh, no, but that's all the profiles we have at, uh, at Resin. It's uh, really basic. It's a text file, and it shows you for each model uh, which target, sub-target version. So that allows you to select the right uh, image builder. And then for now, we have a single parameter that can change between device. It's this uh, offloading uh, parameter. And then all the other parameters are actually the same for all our devices, so it doesn't appear here. So this is really a very basic example of a profile. Then this is a theta neutral. Uh, so remember they are using a template-based system. And so here it's for a device uh, RE 6500. And uh, it's, a, it's a YAML file. And you have several sections. Uh, one which tells you which, again, image builder you want to, to use. And then it describes which file should be co copied to the image with templating. It has a, a bit of network description. And then some parameters, uh, again, offloading, like us. Uh, so you see it's a mix between uh, hardware description that is needed to, to put the right configuration and uh, what you actually want to put on the device. And then the third example, so this is Tenba from, uh, from Pedro, actually. So I, I never know if it's uh, if he's from Giphy or Exocat. Uh, and so it's, it's again um, YAML. And uh, it describes, uh, so here I put three profiles, but some of them do not actually look like they are tied to a specific device. And again, uh, you have target, sub-target, you have some hardware description. And uh, what's interesting is that you see that there is some inheritance, so that you can, um, you don't have to repeat everything for, for new devices. So um, I did this three shot because we want to improve what, uh, what we do at Resin. And I think there's an opportunity to, to build a better profit system. Um, the goal would be that uh, if we had um, a standard and, and, uh, and good way to describe uh, images, I mean, what, what we want to customize in an image, uh, it would be nice to have this system that is usable by several tools. Like I could write a profile for what I want my image to be, and I could build it with my own tools. I could send it to the, attend this is a web, uh, web interface, and I would get the same image. 
and I could share my uh, my profile with other community networks. So it, I think it would be a, a good thing. And it should be descriptive, like most of what we saw. It just describes what what should uh, be the result, but not uh, not actual scripts and how uh, how we do it. So it will allow uh, it will allow several use cases. It should be extensible. So like uh, like Temba, it's good to have inheritance. And uh, of course, it's, it starts to look a lot like Ansible or, or Puppet. So we, it, it would be better if we keep things simple and just address uh, a few use cases, but not a generic configuration framework, because uh, that not, that's not the, the goal. OK, so that's it for me. Thank you, and if you have any question or discussion, I'm, I'm available. And we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions, and they're coming in on the chat. Do you just want to go ahead and read them out and answer them? Yeah, and back on you a bit. So from Daniel, uh, packages can contain UC default scripts to modify configuration. Yes, indeed. So UC defaults, actually, so you can either, in, I mean, there's a specific file system path where you can put these scripts, and either you put it by yourself uh, in the image builder, or you can include them in packages, of course. Yeah, what I meant was uh, including them in packages, because that's also how we start doing it in LibreMesh now, which is such a templating system, so that the communities just have, like, each community has an OpenWT package, which you can then also easily install in the image builder. And that allows you then to also, of course, set um, UCI defaults. Basically, I asked that question before your slide showed that, yeah, you considered UCI defaults. And then it's oh, okay. answered by that already. <laughs> okay. It's an, it's, an, it's an interesting idea. Uh, did you find how to easily automate the kernel for open WRT? So I'm not sure I understand the question. How to easily build the kernel? Hmm. So basically, in the image in the image builder, you cannot uh, rebuild the kernel because it's um, it's actually included in the image builder uh, tarball. You have the kernel and you have all the modules. And what the image builder do is just packaging everything together in a single file system. So if you want to rebuild the kernel, of course, you need to to build things from scratch. I think. So the profile systems described in the end were unrelated to open WRT, the this target profile, right? Oh yes, there's also a system of profile in open WRT. Uh, so yes, it's unrelated. Yeah, it's more the idea to have profiles to describe how you customize the image. While in open WRT, I think it's just a way to, to define a default set of package, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And Paul points out uh, network profiles for LibreMesh. So thank you. I didn't uh, see that before. So maybe I have a question about that. The, Dango said that putting a device as a package, as an open WRT package to get the the appropriate configuration, the, 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 the template comes from this open WRT package. Is that? Or I'm lost. I'm asking about the the way LibreMesh solves the same problem. No? So I don't know. <laughs> Daniel, if you, if you want to answer. And now that Paul apparently also showed up, um, even though I don't know which hour it is in his time zone, but he's there now and he um, 
did all this network profile stuff, so maybe he can speak for himself. That'd be great. I think he's joining the Okay, as, as he remains silent, um, uh, let me explain. Like the idea there is basically to have uh, packages describing the whole community profile in UCI default scripts. This would not be per device um, specific packages then. However, if you want to differentiate based on the um, device, you could do that by just having like cases in uh, your UCI default scripts. Or then, of course, if it becomes more complicated, that's why I think LibreMesh came into life because then, ah, we need to do some runtime detection of like how many mm -hmm. Ethernet ports do we have? And so can we actually reconfigure one for a designated purpose or does it make any sense because we have only one port and then not much sense to do that. So that then like you would figure that out at runtime, which of course is also not ideal. I see that your approach of like having profiles defined and then you would make the image for that specific device is kind of more elegant than detecting stuff at runtime. Thanks for your talk. I have a question as well. Um, I've been doing similar things a few years ago and in the end I came up with the perspective that the open WRT UCI system system is somewhat limited when it comes to configuration management. And I was um, also looking for ways to, that to pose a possible alternative. And and from my opinion, this, this kind of profile management is more or less a workaround for this open WRT configuration management uh, problem. Um, What's your opinion on, on UCI? Have you considered alternatives? Are you happy with your approach? So basically, I, um, I think there are two different use cases. One, uh, oh, okay. Um, I mean, the use case I address is that you build your image, you deploy it on a device, and then it mostly won't change. Uh, it will just run, and at some point, the user will upgrade it, and that's it. And maybe what you are referring to is more like um, how to manage a device that is running on the field remotely. Or oh, did I get your question wrong? Or is it just a general you see? Uh... No, it's like um, if you if you have like this profiles, so you try to model configuration for router. And you use this configuration model um, uh, for post-processing and installation. And in the end, you're, uh, let's say, or, or at least I was unhappy because I was also in the need to, to include scripts who were doing some inspection at runtime. I wasn't able to separate the OpenWRT configuration from the configuration provided by the profiles from the configuration provided at runtime and from the configuration uh, set by the user. So in the end, it was like an, uh, un, uh, an, an unadaptable system. You cannot do any updates to the resulting end system so far. Mm -hmm. um, and and I was always looking at, at some um, alternatives. OK, there's this uh, certain. Um, um, controller, I don't remember right now who is basically. Down, yeah. Hmm? Down, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It, it, not Don. Don is uh, for roaming, which is great, but, but there's another one and it just okay. translates UCI to JSON and in order to have some repository on, on the server side, but that does not. Um, help much, I think. So how do you think is your framework positioned in this, this complex situation? Well, I agree that you see, uh, so that was I was mentioning, when you update the device, when you upgrade the device, it's a bit of a mess to know, to detect that the user has customized things and you should not revert back to the, to what the script wants to do. So I agree, it's, it's there are some issues with that. Uh, so, but yeah, the approach is to work with the UC system and not try to replace it or to add something on top. Uh, I mean, that would be maybe too ambitious. Uh, 
All right, um, time's flying like an arrow. So I would like to say thank you to Baptiste for his very interesting and practically oriented task. I, I learned a lot and I hope um, you will share the slides with us so we can put them on the wiki later on. Yeah, sure. And uh, the next person is a morning again with an introduction to mesh routing. Um, let me find his name in this list and make him the presenter. And here you go, M. Warning. The floor is yours. Okay, I hope uh, my audio is coming in. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, works Check. just fine. Please go ahead with your talk. Okay, very well. Okay, thank you, Juan. Uh, hello again. Uh, this is Moritz from Berlin. And uh, today I have a talk with, uh, for you. Uh, it's an introduction to mesh routing for all these people who, uh, say, who don't really know what mesh routing protocol is like, what the problem is we're trying to solve, we are trying to solve. And um, for everybody who thinks this mesh routing protocol thing is something uh, mysterious, something uh, hard to understand, I want to hopefully prove you otherwise. And, uh, show, show you how it's basically working in most cases and how you can do your own in theory. Okay, uh, let's get started uh, with uh, the introduction. Okay, let's click. Okay, uh, today, yeah. Okay, what is routing? What is mesh network? How can we have like a mesh routing protocols? And then I will uh, give you a few things like uh, some ways to distinguish mesh routing protocols. I think that might might help. Um, so if you don't know what proactive versus reactive routing is, distance, link state, and such, um, how can we distinguish between those? Uh, I think that might be quite helpful. Okay, let's start. So first, what is routing? Routing is the problem with getting some piece of information, something, maybe even a parcel, uh, to some place, and uh, there's only as an address uh, on the parcel, but we don't know uh, how to get it there. I mean, we can get it to some friend and say, yeah, uh, do you know, maybe this person uh, here, uh, just forward it to, to some other person you know. I mean, we only have a limited amount of friends, and but those have friends as well, and so in theory, we could, like, give a packet to a neighbor and uh, he will forward the packet and hopefully it will arrive in, at, at some point. Or it might get lost or it might end up in a circle. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And so say, that's the same thing with uh, packet networks. And um, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, one another approach is to screen, uh, which is not very nice. Um, but sometimes it's quite helpful. You, it's the equivalent in, in networks is uh, so-called a broadcast. Um, and um, yeah, but if everybody does that, it's a bit hard. And of course, you can't scream loud enough for everybody to, to hear you and uh, that uh, you are looking for Alice and Alice, uh, uh, you have a packet for her and um, so then she comes to you or you, well, that doesn't really work very well, and especially when everybody tries to scream. Um, yeah, so let's go forward how we can improve that situ situation. But first we must understand what a mesh network is. It's like a bit of a social network when, we, when it comes to screaming. Um, but for computers, it usually means IP networks of computers, which are nodes, or I call them nodes, it's a bit more general. And uh, with mesh networks, I mean, network is a very general term, but mesh network is really saying, okay, this can be an arbitrary topology. Topology is basically uh, some structure, the lack of it, how a network is connected. I mean, these nodes and with links. So we can have like a line, this is a topology specific one, a, a lattice or even a tree structure. But uh, when we talk about mesh networks, it's an arbitrary topology. So the really important thing here is that is troubling lots of routing protocols are loops. Loops is when you send a packet in one direction and it comes back the other one direction and without having reached a destination. 
or maybe going in a loop uh, at some other point for all eternity. We also had ha te might have that on the internet, but a lot of gods from pre that prevent that. Specific rules uh, called algorithms, uh, time to live uh, counters where every destination when a packet gets to another hop in the network, then the counter goes down and at some point uh, when it reaches zero, the packet is discarded just as a safety measure. Uh, so we don't like loop, don't loop around a packet for all eternity and clog our net and cl uh, clogging our networks. Okay, so mesh networks are a special kind of network, a very arbitrary one, and uh, especially what uh, most community mesh networks uh, deal with is also. Uh, some property of mesh networks, which is uh, mobility and ad hoc, which is uh, I like to throw in one bucket here. Um, this is especially um, relevant for Wi-Fi networks. So if you have like mobile ad hoc network, or let's say mobile networks with cables, um, I have never seen that uh, because it would be end in a disaster when you have. Uh, uh, two vans connected to the cable and the vans are driving around. So that's not good for the cable. So um, usually with mobile networks, uh, you have uh, Wi-Fi uh, with a specific signal range. Um, and ad hoc means that uh, any device can show up or disappear. I mean, can, can join the network at some place and maybe then uh, be turned off with this five networks and with these five cheap off the shelf Wi-Fi nodes. It's usually usually the case that nodes get turn, turned off uh, when the store closes or maybe it's in, in the morning the, the customers, uh, the people come back and turn on, on the router, stuff like this. Um, <clears throat> so, now that we know what uh, mesh networks are, uh, we can go to the big picture. I mean, uh, you most many people have already some uh, knowledge of, of IT and networks a bit. Um, what usually is, is done, for example, in companies is called static routing, uh, which means that uh, in the IT department they have, okay, let's say a, a big whiteboard and then they say, yeah, we have this department, this department, we have a cable running through the wall there. And so they have the big oversight and then decide, okay, this device gets this IP address range and so forth and so on. And um, that's how we do it. So that's really easy and that scales very well, um, but it doesn't work uh, with mobility uh, at all. And the other thing, type of network, everything else is basically dynamic. Um, where we need something like a discovery mechanism and, and fallbacks. Um, when a node appears, it needs to discover other nodes and be discovered itself. It wants to be, be seen or to be used to, to forward traffic, for example. So in, for IP networks, uh, well, the usual the components are switches. Um, and I have a typo there, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, we have uh, a mix of static routing and the internet is a bit more dynamic in a way that uh, it's it works with a lot of fallback plans that are automatic. Um, the real world is a bit messy and a mix of different protocols that have different properties. Uh, yeah, but may maybe a bit later to, uh, to that because we want to focus on on ad hoc mesh networks. So the, if you look on the internet, you maybe uh, stumble on this term, MANET, uh, which is short for mobile ad hoc, ad hoc network. So that's uh, what is used in, in many papers uh, or you, some uh, working groups, they use this term. So just to, to mention it, that you know what it's about, that this is a common sh uh, abbreviation. And um, okay, and the task here is um, Imagine you you hand out a firmware for, for routers, uh, for community network, and everybody downloads this firmware. It's identical. You put it on, on, on the routers. They wake up in some random uh, place in the town to random times. Well, not like on, off, on, off, but uh, sometimes they're off, and maybe the P 
appear at a different place. And um, imagine you are this node, everybody is identical, you wake up, you have no knowledge of your surrounding, you have but a unique name, let's say it could be a MAC address, which is uh, printed usually on some sticker on the Wi-Fi router, and then uh, you need to, well, to find out who is in your neighborhood, um, who are the, the and uh, who are attached to those in, in the neighborhood, which I don't see directly because my Wi-Fi range is limited, and uh, who is behind them, and so on. I mean, the problem is here. Uh, Every, usually we do something that is uh, broadcasting through ho the whole network, so every know, everyone knows, okay, uh, this, this node exists, and then you need to figure out where can, how can I send a packet to which no one of my neighbors. So in the end, if the neighbor does the same strategy, uh, then in the end the packet will arrive at the destination. And um, this is basically the problem is of mesh routing protocols. And um, first, uh, well, I want to introduce a very simple strategy that is um, done by well, most routing protocols. There is a lot of optimizations, of course, but in most routing protocols, it's the same. And if you if you use it, then you already have a routing protocol. Maybe it doesn't scale very well. It lots needs a bit more love, but uh, basically, it will work. So the first problem here is, of course, to discover neighbors. I mean, this is just simple. You shout every few seconds, maybe uh, some packet, here I am, and, and everybody does that. And since everybody has a limit range, limited range and none of your neighbors especially like uh, uh, distributes this, this shout to, to its neighbors again, or let's, let's limit to that case, that everybody know, knows who the neighbor, who his neighbor is. Uh, are and uh, and we don't clock the network, uh, so that's very easy to find out. But of course, um, we only we also want to know which neighbors our neighbor has, and so also want to know everyone in the network so we can reach them. Janusz, I think uh, your mic is microphone oh, is on. I'm, I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm uh, I'll ask in the end, okay? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so naive uh, approach is uh, is to announce ourselves, our presence, so in the end we can send packets, is to just flood flood all, all data. And, uh, well, the thing is, uh, yeah, this is our discovery me mechanism. Uh, I said here, no discovery needed, but okay, this is discovery, and we always can also find a best route by attaching a so-called metric uh, to each packet, uh, our hello packets we send. And um, when we get a packet uh, that gets forwarded from one node over different routes, and it arrives at our point, and we see, okay, this packet has uh, taken like 10, 10 hops, and the other one just five, okay, if we want to send this node a packet, we, of course, choose the neighbor to forward this packet that only uh, that um, was used to for us to to get the uh, the packet hello packet with only five hop counts with five hops. So that works, uh, but it's horribly inefficient because everyone is like uh, shouting to everybody uh, through the network, and of course uh, loops loops are horrible here. Because uh, when you shout and every neighbor is instructed to, to sh shout this information to its neighbors and so on, then of course you have a shouting match and sh some shouts will of course go through a loop if it exists. And then you have infinite shouts, which is horrible, it's, it's hell. And that's how, how you break your network. Okay, and the main thing I want to present here is the mechanism to do efficient shouting, um, which basically works by... Uh, yeah, by introducing uh, something that is called a sender ID and a sequence number. Um, sender ID is just a sender. It can be a MAC address or an IP address. And, and uh, then we also attach to this uh, um, a number that goes, goes up. Um, 
every time we, we send send it a new, I mean, from the originator, for example, I myself, I send to each neighbor, I see a shout uh, and say, yeah, it's Moritz and uh, sequence number is zero. This is my, zero, well, let's say one, my first shout uh, and one and every node uh, that forwards this packet, uh, um, every neighbor, uh, remember, okay, first shout from this cell, uh, with the sequence number one, and uh, then it will be rebroadcasted to its neighbors, and it might come back over some other route, and then the node will receive this shout from Moritz with sequence number one, and uh, it will, will look up in this own memory and say, oh, I just received that over some other, from some other neighbor. So. As long as uh, the sequence number is not uh, not new and something uh, I haven't heard yet, uh, I just rebroadcast it. Or uh, I mean, if it's not new, then I won't rebroadcast it. If rebroadcast it, uh, if it is new, uh, then of course I will do. And so this is a simple way to prevent uh, this shouting match, where uh, these packets go into a, into a loop. So this makes this flooding quite efficient. And all is like a backbone for its typical routing protocols. I mean, the main thing is to avoid loops. Uh, loops. And uh, in these networks, you have like uh, two kinds of packets. Then, so I just thought uh, was talking mostly about hello packets, which is a uh, type of management traffic for discovery. And uh, then, of course, you want to reach some website, do SSH or whatever. Um, this is, these are data packets, so, so you have in the header just the destination maybe, and every node uh, will have uh, hopefully then uh, heard the shouts of everybody else and knows of the shout from this neighbor. So if I send this data packet with the destination to that neighbor, it will reach the destination if the neighbor does the same thing and so on. So, and um, of course there are different ways to, even there to do it, um, for example, with Batman, uh, I mean, I want to talk about distance vector protocols here, and the other one is link state. Uh, what I've just described is more of a distance vector approach. Distance vector, I mean, you can imagine uh, it's some something about direction. I send something in a direction. and uh, But each node doesn't really know how all my neighbors are connected to its neighbors. And uh, they only know, well, uh, when I want to send someone a packet, I need it to forward it to, to that node. Or if that one is not available, I send it to the other one. And um, this is called a table, so-called table-driven uh, approach. It's like, well, a synonym of distance vector, I would say. Uh, so it's, it's the same. And uh, yeah, and every node remembers a table with original sender uh, received, uh, from which neighbor it was uh, received, so for many packets, and some pass cost, which, which might be a uh, hop count or bandwidth and so on. I, I have a slide for that. And this is basically called distributed Dijkstra algorithm, shortest pass algorithm. If you are studying uh, information uh, informatics or something like that, uh, you might have that in the first uh, or second semester. So just for those guys. Okay, and link state is a bit different. Uh, typical example would be OSR, which um, some have heard about. Same for Batman. And uh, basic, the, the, the different, diff basic difference is that you have the whole topology in, in the memory. So you know every node knows which other node uh, is how it's connected. So it has like the whole map of the network. Um, and then it can do like uh, some shortest pass algorithm on there and say, okay, um, I have calculated from this topology map, I have now in my mind, okay, uh, uh, in my RAM, uh, this is the shortest route and I need to forward a packet that just came in to this neighbor. To, so if that neighbor does the same algorithm, then it will reach the destination. So that's a typical example of a link state protocol, which has, uh, well, a few doorbox, maybe a few uh, um, beneficial things. Um, for example, if you really want to uh, do, uh, have control over 
uh, which hops a packet is transmitted, then source routing, uh, sorry, link state routing is uh, a good uh, thing. Uh, because uh, then you can say maybe, yeah, uh, these nodes have maybe a smaller latency or less links uh, or but uh, if I go over a few more hops uh, there on this map, uh, then I can use uh, better bandwidth and stuff like that, or I don't trust these nodes, then you can easily work around that. So this, this is something that is, can be enabled by link state. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's these broad uh, categories. And there's also another category, uh, how you can distinguish between routing protocols, which is, uh, right? Ah, I think that's the point where the slides got mixed up. Ah, proactive and reactive routing. Um, so you can think of, okay, uh, every node I've told you just uh, the example uh, shouts out every few seconds uh, his I'm still alive message. Um, so everybody knows uh, where that, how to reach that node and that the node, this node exists. And, but you can say, okay, um, we don't have that much traffic to to forward. We uh, to uh, we do, we don't have much tra traffic in this network. We don't have um, a lot of nodes changing. So why why do we proactively uh, figure out how to reach someone? About we get a packet and then we figure out how to reach somebody. It makes sense when we have sensor networks which only occasionally. Uh, want to transmit data, and if you only have battery powered devices, stuff like that, then you can say, okay, I only discover where node is when a packet comes, and that is uh, a reactive approach. We re react to a packet that is coming in. So if the management traffic uh, is lower than the than the traffic data traffic. Um, uh, sorry, when the management traffic is higher than the actual data you want to transmit, then a, a reactive approach is usually a good, good, good way to go here. Um, but in most uh, community networks, people want to uh, um, reach sites like uh, on the internet, stuff like that, and it goes uh, all different ways uh, a lot. Then a proactive approach uh, guarantees that you quickly. Uh, find the route, or you already have discovered the route, and so forwarding is very quick. Okay. Oh, and this was the, the slide uh, about matrix. Uh, I already told you that uh, there can be different uh, types of matrix, and usually it's hop count in uh, most academic protocols, um, where, I mean, I get maybe a message from some some uh, node far away, and it sends me a they send me it sends a packet by broadcasting, and in some on some routes it will receive me from right and left, and the one packet from left, the hello packet that got forwarded, has like a, a, a hop count of, of of two, that's really low, and the other one has like hop has a hop count of ten. So if I want to send that originator node a packet, of course, I will send this packet first to the, to the neighbor that uh, has only two hops uh, distance to the destination. And from there, I'm, it only needs one hop and then it has arrived. But of course, we can also have other metrics uh, like packet law, loss or bandwidth or even energy. There are a lot of different ways to do it. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, just an overview of different uh, mesh routing software and a bit like uh, if it's for distance vector or link state. Uh, I have to say today there are a lot of routing protocols also that have a bit of both. Uh, you can do that. Um, but uh, it's a bit easier to think about it in these categories. So I've also put something like BGP down there, which is the spine of the internet, I would say, the internet protocol, um, <clears throat> which is also a bit complicated. Uh, with BGP, for example, you want to have something like, uh, um, yeah, you want to attach uh, your own costs uh, to routes and stuff and avoid certain routes. Uh, so that's a big plus for BGP. And OSPF has a nice property. It doesn't do like, uh, well, it's it's a, basically a spanning tree, uh, and it uh, tries to avoid any route uh, or it pretends the specific routes are not there, 
uh, maybe as a backup because they would lead to to a loop. So uh, in the, then you get a spanning tree, a tree structure, and there you can route pretty well. Okay, uh, what else is there? Oh yeah, a small uh, X course on the internet. Uh, yeah, it, it's more complicated because on the local level we have uh, this broadcast domain layer two with switches. It's a star topology. And then uh, on the company ISP uh, areas, you have subnets, uh, tree structures, and on the internet, you have uh, BGP. Um, I don't want to get really into that because this is an introduction. Uh, just to give you an, uh, a hint that also there, um, you have different routing, you have different routing protocols um, that have sim using, uh, this as using similar techniques. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's it. Um, so if somebody has a question, please please ask or can just read, read it out. Mm. Yeah, some people are typing. Mm. Typing, typing, typing. Uh, maybe there will something up. No, no. Because I can see One just too a, many a quick uh, director's information. Uh, yeah, my desk. we have about three minutes for questions before we switch to the lightning talks. And uh, please don't worry, okay. but I'll take uh, the, what, uh, the presenter right from you and prepare the next slide. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so, somebody, Matthias S is uh, writing that. Uh, uh, he's going to talk maybe about BGP and the lightning talk, which is awesome. I'm very tuned. Um, and I guess we can hand over to the next presentation then. There no, seem to be no more questions. And uh, yes, this is like the first part. Maybe next time there will be a second part, the theoretical limits of mesh routing. Thank you very much and morning. And it seems that we are handing off to Dangle WRT uh, right now. So this is the lightning talk session and uh, Daniel is going to um, have the next 10 minutes for his presentation and questions. No, he decided otherwise. Let's see what happens next. Well, I just had to switch on the microphone before I share the presentation because otherwise I don't I don't have access to that interface anymore. Okay. Oh, okay. So here we go. Um, I bring you some news from the host APD land. Can everybody hear me well? Um, just wave or say something if you can't, please. I will still hear you. Good. Yes. Good. So um. What, what, what is that? Host APD and WPA supplicant are user space daemons managing Wi Fi interfaces. It's a project created 2001 by Juni Malinen. Originally, it was for the Prism 2 802.11b PCI hardware. That's like almost 20 years ago. Just have that in mind. So it became the default to manage your CFG 802.11 wireless interfaces on most Unix based operating system. Um, including Android, which uses WPA supplicant, even for access point mode. So also and we're not seeing your screen. I'm sorry. We, we can't see your screen at, the screen at the moment. That's very sad, because it says that I'm sharing it. Um, let me see what's happening with Big Blue Button. Uh, I think the presentation has to be removed, right? Ah, the presentation has to be removed. So how do I do that? I never use Big Blue There's Button. There's a minus on the top right corner. Like that. Now we see only Moritz uh, in very large. Um, to share my webcam. Not sharing. Uh, ah, okay. I think um, there's, this there may are... be. No. No. I can share sure. my screen again, but it's already saying that I'm doing that. Um, let's do it again then. Can you see it now? Yeah, there's a starting icon now, so we might have beautiful, a chance. Beautiful. Beautiful. So oh, yeah, it's moving. all a bit more complicated, apparently. Um, is it actually doing something? Yeah, I, now you can at least can see me, hopefully. Hello. 
Hey. Yeah, I can see you, but not your screen yet. Ah, oh, okay. now it's oh, not. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, oh. now you should see it. Okay, so Ooh. sorry, I'll start over. So, no this is from Host APD Land. Once again, Host APD is used a lot um, on Linux to manage your Wi Fi interfaces. We use it in OpenWRT because OpenWRT by today supports only CFG 8 or 211 drivers. So that's the Linux kernel subsystem to have Wi-Fi. They used to be proprietary and spe hardware specific and driver specific management tools and also authentication demons in the past, like in the first versions of OpenWRT, we still had that for like Broadcom devices and stuff. It still goes on in the commercial world, but we don't deal with that. We use only CFG 8 or 211. Hence, we also use host APD for access point interfaces, WPA supplicant for encrypted station mesh or ad hoc interfaces. And as both those demons have like, they share the same code base. So they also have some quite some overlap. So um, we also link that into one multi-call binary called WPAD, which then provides both functionalities in one binary. So it sounds kind of simple um, because what we have to do in OpenWT is basically just for each interface, we generate the configuration file using a bunch of scripts, and then we start the daemon, right? However, if that sounds too simple, we build 24 variants of uh, host APD and WPA supplicant and our own WPAD combined. This is due to different um, cryptographic providers such as OpenSSL or Wolf SSL or using the internal cryptography or different feature sets being included to like fit into very space constrained systems. If that still sounds too simple, well, we also pile like 280 kilobytes of patches on top of the upstream project. We have an OpenWT specific UBUS interface added. We have two and a half thousand lines of shellcode to actually generate that configuration. And all this is spread around three different packages, host APD, Mac 80211, and NetFD. So it's really quite a mess, frankly speaking. However, well, also 80211 is like constantly being amended and it's like it's a development for 20 years and it's kind of iterative. So it piles up and so are our shell scripts. We do want those cool UBUS interfaces, even though, of course, um, WPA supplicant and host APD both have their own um, control sockets. However, um, we decided to have UBUS instead, which is much cooler and much more flexible. And so what's new? So that's just a, a short overview of what happened in the last year and a half, because it's a lot. And that's why I decided to do this talk. And there are some things in this list which kind of will affect everybody if you want it or not. But I hope that it's for the good. So, but let's start with the popular case, which is WPA3. So WPA3 is the new thing for um, encryption. It uh, brings you perfect um, uh, forward secrecy um, on the wireless level, which means even if somebody has your password, if he didn't actively interfere and man in the middle, you, he cannot listen to your traffic which is kind of great. We do want that. And it also comes with mandatory management frame protection. So that's like the mitigation to crack and similar attacks which we've seen in the past. So other third parties can't just disassociate you and then you would reassociate and repeat the handshake. And this kind of stuff is prevented by that. And we in OpenWRT also support the EAP192, what is also known as WPA Enterprise Suit B. These are like newer ciphers for WPA Enterprise. So if you have more than just a simple password to grant network access, you have like TLS or other like EAP stuff with Radius server, then that also has like its WPA3 uh, version of it, um, which has improved security. So there's also a transition mode, which allows to run an access point in a way that both WPA2 and WPA3 client can connect to it. And um, all this is already supported in Lucy, all the stuff in host APD, it was just basically enabling it and wrapping it in scripts. But we needed um, cryptography because the elliptic curve crypto primitives are not built into um, host APD. So it either needs OpenSSL, but OpenSSL is too big. But then Sean Parkinson of Wolf SSL contributed support to host APD since 2017. And by now, I'm talking like May, June 2020, things actually became like really usable. It's on the same level. It works. So probably and like very highly probably OpenWT20.xx will ship with Wolf SSL by default. 
So now to the thing which will affect all of us. So what we were doing until now, sorry, was there a question? No, never mind. Um, so what we were doing until now is for each radio interface, we first check if it has an access point, and if so, NetFD launches a bunch of scripts to generate the configuration and then launches a individual host APD instance for that radio. And then at the same time, if there are any non-access point interfaces for each of them, NetFD again launches a bunch of scripts to generate configuration and then launches a WPA supplicant instance as well. So that results in quite a lot of running instances, like more than we would actually need, because both are actually able to handle multiple radios. So why are we doing this? And John had the genius idea to make this a bit simpler, and I was helping him and working quite a lot to get that to work with WPA supplicant, which kind of looks like that. So we have procd, our init process. Think of systemd on non-openwt. And that just launches the WPAD service, and that's then listening on UBUS. And then for each radio, for each interface, we have NetFD. We still have those 2,500 lines of shell script creating the configuration. And then we just do a UBUS call telling WPAD, please open this interface at this virtual access point, change the channel, or whatever. So that's, well, it's still two instances. It's not, I call it single instance, but it's still two. It's still one of WPA supplicant and one of uh, host APD, but it's for all radios together. And yeah, ah, well, but, but, but we kind of still need to translate that two and a half lines of shell code to UTPL, which is uh, the genius new templating language uh, uh, Jo Philipp Wirch came up with. Have a look at it. It's, it's the future. I was very impressed. It's great. We need to use that instead of shell whenever we can. But dynamic reload is now also possible. That basically means like until now when you were editing uh, your Wi-Fi configuration, such as like changing the name or adding another virtual interface, then all your Wi-Fi subsystem would need to restart in order for those changes to take effect. So that's very annoying because then you also lose all uh, connections uh, when you just change a single setting. And it takes a very long time. So dynamic reload means that now we can use those UBUS um, calls to just quickly add another virtual access point or change the channel. And you would not lose the connections to all clients because a channel change is something which is even uh, uh, intended in Wi-Fi. So we can just send a channel change announcement and then all the other clients would just follow up. I tried that with Android. It works pretty well, actually. Then another new thing, multi-AP. So that's like WDS repeaters on steroids. Um, for that, we need push button authentication. The idea is like to have a vendor independent, nice way to add repeaters. Um, the Wi-Fi Alliance calls that easy mesh, even though it has nothing to do with mesh networking whatsoever. Let's just call it multi-AP because that's what it really it matches the description much better. Um, and we added UCI configuration um, for access point and station interfaces, and now also improved uh, WPS because we also need WPS for clients to do that. Then we have Opport 2.0. 90 um, seconds to go. Yeah, sorry, I started two minutes late. <laughs> um, it's an extension to um, interworking, tons of new settings, servers, package to even try the onboarding process. We have opportunistic wireless encryption that's unauthenticated but open um, encrypted um, networks. Also there, there is a transition mode so that you can just have an open network. And if clients already support it, I recently heard recent Android does support it, then they would um, do an encrypted handshake to have encryption, even though the network was unauthenticated. We also have new patches for DFS and 802.11s for the mesh networks. Um, we used to have patches before, which were submitted by Peter O. Now Markus Tile has polished and updated them. We include them. And that actually also works in case of radar events. Then again, channel change announcement would broadcast, or you could set a deterministic list of which other channels the clients would try or the other mesh nodes would try. That's great. And we have 802.11ax. That's the new high-speed Wi-Fi, also known as Wi-Fi 6, um, as the Wi-Fi Alliance calls it. Um, that's a lot of different things together, as usual, with those marketing terms, like using Wi-Fi in the new 6 gigahertz band that we do not support yet. However, we do support basic HE modes, according to Felix. Um, we have radio research management added. That's basically you ask your clients to do some scans and send the beacons they received back to the access point. We expose those beacons through UBUS so like cool things can use it, can make use of it, and we can use band steering. Take a look at that. Um, 
it's great. It can do band steering even on a single device with just two radios, but also on multiple devices. It's completely decentralized. It doesn't require a central controller. That's very nice. A lot of people were involved in doing that, so the list is very, very long. Um, yeah, great work, um, great team, amazing. If you want to learn more, just check out OpenWT or the host APD project, which is a bit outdated website, I guess, but the Git tree is there as well. Thank you. Any questions? If we have a moment, I don't think so. We might just switch to the um, Jitsi channel to handle questions, maybe. Yes, we can take a question or two. Anything uh, urgent? Anything pressing? Yeah, sorry, it had to be that fast. Like I was planning for 15 minutes, and then I realized, yeah, I can do it in 10 minutes. But yeah, um, that's how it is. That's great. I have everything recorded. Great. <laughs> we have much more questions for all the little details in there. So thanks a lot. And next time, more questions. Yeah, as I said, we can switch to a Jitsi channel. Um, I, I, of course, this was mostly not my work. Like I'm presenting other people's work here, but um, I was involved in the review a lot, and I um, also did some of the work for multi AP, um, and of course to get the the Wolf SSL variants going. So, if people have questions, I can most likely answer most of them. Unfortunately, Matthias can't come over to the Jitsi yet because I think he's our next speaker. Is that right? Who's doing the firmware selector? Ah, right. He's not. Uh, OpenWT firmware selector. Someone edited this talk through the wiki, and we don't know who the person is. Didn't identify. Hi, it, thank so. you. Thanks, Tango <coughs> WRT. Oh, sorry, I, I think that was me. Uh, well, we don't know. We don't know. Oh, uh, I sure did. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, let me just uh, share my screen and then I'll uh, show what I mean. Uh, sorry for inserting it in the wrong table, but I don't think it's a big problem. Uh, it was a mistake, but uh, I intended to give this uh, lightning talk. Okay, um, let me figure out how to share my screen. Uh, is it under settings? No? I just made you the uh, presenter, and now you should have uh, an additional fourth button uh, next or off to the right of the mute button. Ah, yes, right. Select. Um, uh, and allow. Let's see if that works. Oh yeah, and how it works. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, welcome to the Infinity Channel. No. Um, yeah, I want. Hello, my name is Moritz uh, from previous talks. Uh, I want to present uh, the OpenWT firmware selector, which uh, usually, well, was called the called uh, the yet another firmware selector you see here, hopefully. Um, I've worked on some firmware selectors before. Basically, what, basically what it does is uh, you enter some model and then you get the right firmware. Uh, we use that in our Freimfunk uh, community. And I also already did a few iterations and they were quite complicated. And I just, and now I have something like yet another one. And, um, yeah, let me pose this uh, to you. Uh, this one is currently hosted under the openwt.org. And you can see uh, here, you can select the version. And then you say something like 841. Yes, and have, we have this model, for example. And then you have the checksum, uh, build model, and such. So this is originally a project I uh, built for, for Freifunk communities, um, <coughs> which um, is really nice, uh, which is really uh, easy to, to set up. It's uh, plain, uh, well, it's HTML and JavaScript, but there's no framework and it's uh, really simple. And of course, to prove it that it works, yeah, so I get the download button uh, and uh, the dialogue. So that's quite easy, or I can 
to say Netgear, and I got a lot of net different uh, things I can select. And of course, I can switch to different releases, and then I get an update here. And um, yeah, it's uh, written it basically as this folder, which has a few JavaScript files in it. Oh, something I can show you as well. We have different languages. So thank you to everyone who provided the translation. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's it's quite easy to, to customize even. Uh, basically, what it does is, um, uh, is uh, yeah, OK, yeah. This is like his, this is a project for in the OpenWT domain, uh, which only very minor differences to, to, to my project where it originated. Um, <clears throat> and what uh, it works on is like with recent OpenWT versions, uh, they have the ability to generate uh, JSON files with all this information. So that was a big help for me and uh, has been pushed by, by Paul, uh, mostly, and heard by others and stuff. And uh, that's because now we can have like all the uh, information about the models, uh, at least uh, firmware uh, file, the hashes, the name of, of the model and stuff in a JSON file, and we can use that. And uh, you can enable it when you go to the make menu config menu, then you have uh, global build settings, and then now there should be something like create JSON info files per build image. And that will generate JSON files, <coughs> which then can be like picked up with some script I wrote, a uh, Python script, which uh, collects all this information, put it in, into files, and inside the W3WW folder, which all, and um, uh, customs, uh, sorry, uh, and sets uh, the configuration. So all the newest uh, versions can be selected. So that's quite easy. And um, if you have like an OWT version, which does not have this feature to output JSON files, then you can just apply this commit I've linked here in my repository. And um, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, it's simple. Uh, it, it works. Uh, it's nice. I feel happy. And uh, now we can use it for, well, all kinds of projects. The license is, uh, I think, very permissive. Uh, yeah, it's uh, CC0, uh, uh, which is basically public domain for those people from the US, for example. So you can do everything with it. And um, yeah, and if you have questions, please uh, come forward. I will stop sharing the screen. Oh, wait. Uh, as yeah, I, I, think, I think I've shown you the, the website, so you can uh, get there and get uh, and download it and see if it works for you. And uh, yeah, I'm happy about, happy about the project, how it goes. It uh, went now for so over half a year or, uh, or more than a year, uh, about a year now. And uh, it has been a lot of work, has seen a lot of revisions and different adjustments, and now it's as like a, for me, it's a fine, fine date now. But I'm happy, of course, for every merge request, fixing bugs and stuff. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Uh, maybe I should look. Yeah, we got a little time. Yeah. But why are there three dots in the shar? Yeah, that's basically on mobile. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Mobile, there's a problem um, that it's not enough space, but I, when I click the hash, then the full hash is, is shown. So this is just for for fitting it on mobile devices. Oh, uh, a mobile developer, um, uh, um, then uh, please uh, have a look, because this is not with, done with a framework, so it would be nice uh, to have bit more improvement because uh, I'm not really a web developer. Uh, it has been fun doing this project, but there's still of uh, like cases that are hard uh, to adjust for me. And so please have a look. Thank you. OK, next one, please. No further questions from the audience? Anything that you would like to ask? Otherwise, we'll switch to the next speaker. 
and applause for you. Thank you. Thank you. Matthias. I have been called on stage. Give me a second. Yes, the mic, mic is yours. Okay, can everybody see me? Looking good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm um, with uh, Funkfeuer Vienna, as uh, everybody might have guessed earlier. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, show a little bit for today here. Um, I'm not about so much about what I've learned in our community network, but what I've learned at my workplace. Um, which is also a sponsor of Funkfire, which I have to thank again, the guys at work. Uh, but my main topic today is about what I've learned about uh, dangers to community networks. So to say what I'm working, I'm working at a um, so-called B2B or backbone uh, ISP that mostly provides connectivity for resale via um, BGP mostly. And uh, what I've learned here is that um, about all the little details about BGP, OSPF, MPLS, and all the stuff that you, we, you can uh, uh, surely ask me later on, is uh, that currently we have a situation where, I don't know if you play games, but I have heard from gamers that it's very common, as we had in the 90s about uh, IRC wars and net splits. This is going on in current gaming networks and gaming online communities as well. So I see in my daily work situations, especially weekend nights or so on, that people are unfair, feel unfair treated about what's going on on the game. And what's there going on is, is uh, they start trying to kick off other people by sending lots and lots and lots of unwanted traffic towards their IP address. The IP address they might have learned about some online gaming snoo sniffer or whatever. So they, they learn an IP address and then they apply lots of traffic to that ad address. Um, we are right now in a situation where a few gigabits are not uncommon in such a situation. And when I'm on duty and I call up the providers in question and tell them, hey, you, you're aware of what's going on? And then I sometimes even hear the situation, oh, Really? That's why the alarms are coming in. Oh, thank you. So most of these commercial networks are not even aware of, of what's going on. And community networks are uh, very much uh, in danger of getting in the same target range if you're not in the situation that everybody knows you and you're liked, like a German fr a Freifunk community has such a brand that is not maybe not worth attacking in the, uh, in, for some people at least. But if, you, if you're if um, you going to get a lot of users, uh, I call them eyeball users, as um, we have networks that consist mostly of people consuming traffic. Um, so what our customers that have eyeball uh, networks, when, if they are very large, they are uh, pretty sure going to see an attack once a week or so. So if your community networks are going to grow, then you must certainly think about the situation where you are go going to get a lot of traffic because one of your users is maybe unwanted on an online game. And what happens? Uh, you feel like uh, strange disconnections, losing traffic, sessions breaking up, you, uh, and you're not sure what's going on. And uh, commercial providers, sometimes if they are aware of uh, their network control or have an SDN or something like that, uh, they use uh, measurements, they measure interfaces, they measure uh, exchange points, they measure where the traffic is coming, where the traffic is going. They might even have an, a net flow analyzing or, yeah, or IP fix or uh, J flow or whatever you call it, but it's basically sniffing uh, um, uh, thousands of your flows and uh, in the headers putting in into the database to have a statistic what's going on in the network. So community networks don't have that. Community networks don't have uh, full-time staff. 
So if, if such a situation happens, then uh, um, I see in the, in the chat there somebody uh, is talking about a one gig core network. Um, uh, yeah, you, you quickly notice DDoS, nothing works anymore. Exactly, that's what's going to happen. Uh, if I can give you an example, I recently had a commercial customer who is basically, say, some some like a, some uh, some an IT company of, of insurances and so on. Uh, they are connected with, um, I guess, uh, in different locations, BGP, gigabit, and they were swamped away by 1.3 gigabits, and that was not uncommon. Just that it happened to them that we have become a target in such a situation. And tech was fairly short, but short enough to uh, overflow one link, BGP connection dropped, and in that moment, all the traffic uh, went over to the other BGP speaker of that AS, and then the other router was, was swamped in traffic, So, uh, and the internal link between their data centers was swapped, was uh, full, fully um, loaded, and they did not notice because yeah all the alarms went off and they did not check what's what was the reason for that and to to keep my talk short um i would like to give a uh, short ideas what's going on on the commercial side so you can have an idea what to do in your com uh, community network uh, the main thing is black holing uh, if, uh, if you black hole traffic then you just um insert a discard route in, into your IGP, whatever that is, um, and, and tell your whoever sees that traffic first just to discard it. That would kick off one IP, the target IP address offline, so the attacker has some sort of um, succeeded, but the, other, but the rest of the network is saved. So you might um, think about when to decide that, who can decide that, and if that's if that's applied for a 15 minute attack, yeah, who can react in 15 minutes, right? So if the attacker goes on for an hour or so, you might have uh, problems uh, at, uh, accessing your management paths. Uh, but yeah, that's one thing. Another cool thing that a, work, a mate of mine is, uh, is helping to develop is BGP flows pack. Um, something like that could be invented for community networks, but it's not there yet. So it's basically in the in the routing protocol there are hidden IP tables rules so fake uh, routes that basically uh, control your IP tables. So if you want to say okay this node may may not need DNS, so then you can drop uh, port fifty free source for one uh, particular participant in your network. So that would solve. Uh, uh, DNS reflection attack, which can be quite volu voluminous. So these are uh, all possibilities that are currently possible in the, let's say, academic and in some networks deployed stage of BGP. So the newer networks do have that. Uh, if you are a large community, commu uh, community network that has a good relationship to your upstream provider, Talk to them, talk to them what they can offer you as black holing at the provider side is usually included if you are having a nice upstream. Um, uh, there's a question, is there a reason for favoring BGP flow spec compared to open flow or P5, um, P4? Uh, I have not uh, looked into P4 yet, so I cannot uh, uh, give you an answer on that. Uh, the BGP is currently favored over OpenFlow because it's in even it's available even in traditional BGP uh, IBGP situations because your uh, your, cl your classic route reflectors can provide that to every node in your provider network, so that's a big plus. But on the other hand, as we look at um, uh, as we look at the current um, situation at level three central link Lumen, uh, how you call it. Uh, company who actually managed to shut themselves down for a few hours by watering up flow spec. Um, yeah, um, that is a dangerous topic. And so in community networks, this is even more of a problem. But um, uh, there's a, there's a com comment that says, um, 
Propagating firewall rules between operators can easily escalate to Pakistan versus YouTube. Uh, yes, you need filters, but you need filters anyway. Uh, we cannot go into RPKI and, and the BGP uh, um, signing and so on. But these are all topics we could likely discuss in, a, in the small room. Uh, I just want to give, in the end, a few more things that I've noticed in my work. If you're attacking a target and the target is starting up firewalling and the attacker usually finds out about that the target is still responsive in the main service, like a web page, then the attacker might decide to attack your borders or the next hop of the target. So uh, when you think about a community network and you have one target that is swamped with traffic and you black hole that one, then the attacker might be uh, tempted to just uh, look at the last trace route to the target and just attack the next hop before the target because it's pretty much sure that that would still hurt the, tar the person behind the target. So keep that in mind that next hop attacks or link net attacks are very common in a big target situation. And the last thing I want to say is root falsification and hijacks. We shortly talked about that uh, by mentioning Pakistan versus YouTube, but we have much, much more situation where somebody even um, um, uh, on accident in inserted um, more specifics to and black hole traffic uh, without intending to do so. So yes, we need filters and yes, we need to find out who is uh, able to announce what. So these are things that are currently happening on the big internet and all these things could be said about community networks as well. But my personal uh, perception is that there's nothing currently going on on that uh, on that page in the community network network side and I would like to start it up and uh, let's start a discussion what could be done to make our community networks more safe more re uh, resilient to error and yeah and also to operate error if somebody turns off the wrong device uh, how fast can we notice that yeah. Uh, famous last words, thank you for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure and hope to see you soon uh, in real life. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today. So um, next up on our uh, list of lightning talks is um, clouds. Okay, here we go. So let me make you the presenter. And uh, please go ahead with your talk, Klaus. Hello. Hi. We'll share my screen. Something's happening. Yeah. yeah. Wow, infinity. OK. I think you can see my screen right now. Yes. Yeah. So I am Claudio, and I will give a short talk about uh, something that I did uh, some time ago, like three years ago that is putting Wi-Fi passwords in the beacons of Wi-Fi. So um, the problem that we have to solve this one is that uh, sometimes there are some large uh, wireless WLAN deployments, uh, like for example at uh, university sites, uh, which uh, require some uh, infrastructure deployment, uh, which is usually uh, solved uh, through radius-based uh, federations. Mm, yes. I, I would say I would say Edrome, for example, and uh, this requires some uh, some effort 
to set up. And also, uh, there is the problem that uh, user authentication threatens the privacy of the users. So sometimes you don't really want to know uh, who is connecting to the network. You only want to know if this person is authorized to do so. So uh, one piece that uh, is fitting into this, the solution to this problem is this uh, thing called ciphertext policy attribute based encryption or CPAB. This kind of encryption works like this. You have an authority, like a certification authority, which uh, can generate uh, public keys. Uh, you should not think about these public keys like uh, um, RSA keys. This, uh, this is a completely a different uh, encryption. So these attribute public keys are generated by the authority. For example, we have uh, um, a public key for the guest attribute, a public key for the professor attribute, a public key for the student attribute. So uh, this authority uh, gives uh, keys, secret keys, to uh, users. For example, to Alice, it will give uh, a key we will issue a key with an attribute which is a professor and it will issue a secret key to Bob with an attribute which is guest and then a service provider can take uh, his public his private key uh, a message M and define a policy and say okay this policy is that only professor or student will be able to decrypt my message and it will uh, encrypt the message using the policy and his private key and uh, if the key of the receiver matches the policy doesn't match the policy he will not be able to decrypt if instead the policy on the ciphertext matches uh, if, if instead the attributes in the key match satisfy the policy on the encrypted text, it will be able to decrypt. Okay. So it's uh, a nice toy. You can define these policies and see uh, the attributes satisfy the policies and decrypt. And one, one other piece that we are fitting in the picture is uh, font and codes. Uh, Fontaine codes are uh, rateless erasure codes. That is, uh, uh, you can generate a potentially limitless sequence of encoding symbols and from a given set of source symbols. And then the original source symbols can be recovered from any subset of the encoding symbols. In a nutshell, it means that if you collect enough uh, encoded chunks, uh, you can decode the message. So you keep uh, collecting chunks until you are uh, you are able to recover the message which is encoded with encoded with a font and code. And so the idea was to uh, was this one was to uh, have a Wi-Fi password encrypted with a policy with CPABE, and then the encrypted uh, the encrypted secret would go to the access point. Then the access point will uh, uh, use font encoding and, uh, and stuff inside the beacons, the pieces of the encrypted secret. The station can take all these chunks. When it has enough chunks, it can recover the encrypted secret. From the encrypted secret, it can hopefully decrypt the, the message, which is the Wi-Fi password. And then it can use the Wi-Fi password to connect to the access point. Okay. Demo time. Uh, I have a short video. I hope you still see my screen. I see. I think yes. Yeah. Okay. So, in the upper side you have the access point, and on the lower side you have the station. So here we have generated a new Wi-Fi password. And it had been encrypted with uh, uh, a policy. 
and it's being transmitted in uh, Fontaine uh, uh, coding. Then on the session side, it will capture the chunks in the beacons and it will decode the password, recover the password, uh, decrypt the password and decode it, and it will connect to the access point. Okay. Now uh, we have zero connected clients, the password has changed. It will connect to the access point, uh, um, decrypting the new password. And the nice thing is that uh, the access point will now uh, generate a new password and the station will uh, still be connected. So we can uh, keep changing passwords on the access point all the time. Okay. So what uh, we had to do is modify host IPD a bit to receive uh, the password of, from an named pipe and receive the information elements for the beacons from, a, from also another named pipe. Uh, also, we had to modify a bit uh, the code that was disconnecting the stations when there was a configuration change. And uh, we also adopted a demo on providing the random passwords, encoded chunks, uh, and yeah, font encoding for info to stuff inside the beacons. And uh, on the station side, we just had an AW scan wrapper and a demo taking this ch the chunks from a name pipe and trying to decode and decrypt. Okay, so uh, this is the the reference uh, to for more information, and you can find the source code here and more information about font and code here and that's all thank you thanks Klaus Welcome. maybe we have some more minutes I guess I don't know if I anybody has any questions what are you using as an attribute based encryption scheme it's called the CPABE uh, do you mean which scheme? Which scheme specifically? Uh, it was the first one. Uh, can't remember the actual reference, but uh, I can uh, I can give it uh, to you offline. Cool. Thank you. Welcome. Is it, I think is it easy to turn? Have some everything? questions in the chat. Sorry, Paul. Uh, is it easy to, I mean, the changes at the station side, um, do you think this can be turned into a patch for WPA supplicant or something? I don't, I don't yes, I was trying to do so. I was trying to port that into actually Android. Uh, it turns out cross-compiling for Android is a bit of a mess for me, at least. But uh, I think uh, that, that is definitely possible. Uh, for the prototype, uh, it was just a wrapper around uh, IW, so it was just uh, taking the information elements from the IW up output. And so how, how much work is it to make most Androids capable? Of understanding uh, I don't know because the the library for CPAB it's already on Android, so it should be a matter of uh, uh, messing mostly with the IW uh, source code. I don't think it's a uh, big work. Okay. So uh, the, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, do we have time? Yeah, Nishan agreed that we can start with his talk a little bit later. So. OK, we have a question from, from Ordex. Hi, Ordex. So uh, does it mean that only users satisfying the policy can be connected at the same time? The others would have to wait, basically. Uh, yes. But you can have a. 
No, uh, so you can change the policy on the access point and the users will not be disconnected. But uh, you can define a policy which is broad enough. Uh, you can use OR and AND. and end so you can define uh, uh, a complex policy which accommodates but uh, groups but groups of users okay you're welcome i don't see any other questions so perhaps we can take this offline or in the other room oh perfect Thank you. Nishan, are you around? Yep. Yeah, hi, Albert. You should have presentation right. Yes. Just a second, I'm switching to the other slide deck for him. Thank you. Okay. Right, and am I audible? A little bit quiet, so maybe... A little bit quiet, quiet. okay, so, yeah, I'll, I'll speak louder. Mm -hmm. That's better. Yeah, because raising the gain will increase static noise. We're a little bit on late in the schedule, but you, you have to fall 30 minutes, okay? Okay, all right. All right, the stage is yours, and you have controls for switching to the next slide right below the, uh, the, the slides. You see that? Yes, I see that. So okay, so turn my. Here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is my first time at Battle Mesh, and first of all, uh, thank you for accepting my talk proposal. Uh, my name is Nishant Sharma. I come from New Delhi in India, where I run a free software business called Unmukti Technology. Unmukti is a word in Sanskrit that means deliverance. And at Unmukti, we build network equipment using open hardware and free software to provide managed network services under the brand Hopbox. Uh, apart from having contributed to Debian installer localization and OpenStreetMap, I also contribute to OpenWRT, although uh, minuscule as of now. Uh, I'm a working group member at Free Software Foundation of India and an associate member at a Free Software Foundation. So uh, Unmukti is in the free software networking business since year 2011. Enterprise. Uh, I will be talking about my experiences with small and medium businesses because they are the customers that we serve which include retail chains, health diagnostic labs, financial accounting firms, food and beverage chains, etc. And these small and medium businesses are uh, spread across the geography of India from large metropolitan towns to uh, metropolitan cities to small towns. And each of their locations have 10 to 150 users. So uh, this is how a typical multi-location SMB network looks like uh, of the customers that we serve. So they have a head office, they have a manufacturing unit or a warehouse, they have retail stores or showrooms, then some applications are in the cloud, they have branch offices or people who are on the run, road warriors and merchandisers. Right, so way back in 2011 and 12, MPLS was the de facto standard for hub spoke connectivity. Uh, it was expensive and had a lot of limitations. 
all the traffic bound to the internet was backhauled to the hub, creating a capacity bottleneck. So also it was not ready for the flurry of cloud hosted services, which businesses were uh, going to move towards in the future. Uh, there were scalability issues. So if new uh, branches are added, uh, bandwidth would require to be increased at the hub site or maybe the gateway equipment need to be upgraded after up to some time if it starts hitting the capacity. So apart from that, reliability and resilience issues were very prominent. So if internet or MPLS goes down at the hub, all the branches would go offline affecting the operations. Traffic prioritization was also, uh, I mean, almost none of our customers whom we migrated from MPLS had heard of QoS and never negotiated with their MPLS providers for this service, which meant packets being randomly uh, dropped whenever bandwidth hit the limit, affecting business critical applications. So at the outset, it seemed inefficient and suboptimal to us. So the challenges were expensive MPLS, suboptimal backhaul over MPLS uh, that we already discussed. The quality of broadband was pretty low because no uptime was guaranteed. Internet lease lines were expensive. Uh, wireless network issues were being uh, faced. So when we tried to gather requirements from the prospects we came to know that they want to use multiple internet links for resiliency they want vpn connectivity between their locations and uh, they wanted optimal usage of bandwidth F firewall and security was not high on priority to them uh, because they <laughs> they were more worried about P2P torrent traffic and web access control. Uh, some of them required wireless network services as well. So those days, uh, let me first okay, tell you uh, the hardware stack that we uh, use to build the solution. So from top to bottom, it's Microtech, then Microtech RB951 UI2 HND. They have, sorry. It's a long model name. Anyway, PC engines, LX, PC engines, APU, uh, you name like MT7621, and then a super microserver which has Xeon processor. So from MIPS to x86, uh, we, we, we tried uh, these architectures to build the solution. So those days SD-WAN was not heard of and we called it multi-WAN. And when we fast forward to today, MWAN 3 is there where we can have multiple kind of links and it is possible to configure at least four kinds of scenarios over various kinds of links. So uh, for example, priority is simple failover, weighted balance is uh, wo bandwidth based volume load balance and force means whatever link is up or down but we just want to use uh, link number two for all the traffic persistence is when uh, a service provider expects that request from you will come through a specific public IP so you just want to use a particular van for that destination. Uh, talking about uh, talking about uh, this lowest latency. Sorry. Yeah. So talking about lowest latency to destination, uh, we are still uh, testing it, where uh, all our selective destinations like 
Office 365 or maybe G Suite or other business applications can be routed over the link which has lowest latency to that particular destination. So load balance and failover was working fine. And then few years down, we realized that in case a link goes bad due to packet loss or high latency, uh, we start getting a lot of complaints and then we have to manually intervene and bring that link down. So, uh, so we, we try to write a patch for MVAN3 and uh, uh, sent a pull request so uh, which added link quality check uh, feature to MVAN3 so that if, uh, if packet loss or latency goes beyond a set threshold the link is pulled down automatically. Right, so after the van is taken care of, traffic prioritization kicked in. So SQM is quite a uh, rage these days, but at enterprise networks, in our opinion, one needs to prioritize applications, destinations, or sources. And limiting bandwidth to a certain host or application is really required and we convince our customers that if you want to restrict uh, bandwidth to say 4 Mbps for a certain service or a host and if the bandwidth which is free is 16 Mbps why are we artificially slowing it down? So we instead prioritize using QS scripts but the limitation is we can only prioritize on the basis of uh, source, destination, ports, or protocols. But in this age of HTTPS everywhere, where we would ideally want to prioritize applications based on the applic yeah, <laughs> prioritize traffic based on the applications, we we miss support for IPSet and LibNDPI. It is very much desired, and I hope one day uh, we have uh, we have support for LibNDPI and IPSet with QoS. VPN for VPNs, uh, we prefer Open VPN for the sake of simplicity and ability to push routes, metrics, and other configuration parameters from the server itself without tweaking individual clients. More so when there are, say, 300 spokes are connected. And if we have to change routing information, maybe Network Ad Hub adds another route another subnet so we can simply make changes at the hub and push new routes to all the clients without tweaking uh, 300 configuration files. So once VPNs were in place, once VPNs were in place uh, and MBAN3 took its own time to detect a link, whether it's up or down. And then OpenVPN trying to reconnect. The delay was at times unacceptable as it affected uh, time sensitive applications or applications which had very low time out value. So we tried to work on uh, dual active VPN tunnels where to separate Open VPN tunnels are created using two links at both the ends, and both are active, but traffic flows through uh, through a primary tunnel. Now, in order to dynamically route, we used OSPF, and to 
do a fast failover we use bft and the package bird is used for that so here is the snippet from the configuration file from bird and this slide has a uh, configuration snippet from open vpn so the trick is to use topology subnet and use different root metrics on the server side and push different root metrics to the clients and then bird will automatically uh, automatically decide on the best route depending on the cost that we have set over ospf right so but life keeps throwing more and more challenges instead of having multiple links assume that only one link is working and that too is experiencing packet loss what to do in such a scenario wait for asp to resolve the issue then we discovered fec one of my friend was talking about fec forward error correction which is available in very high end proprietary uh, solutions so uh, there is a package called software called udp speeder written by wang yu uh, so fec works by sending redundant packets uh, and then reassembling them to recreate uh, originally sent packets in our experience we could reduce packet loss of uh, 20% to less than 1% uh, uh, at the cost of increased bandwidth by 1.5 to 1.8 times and slightly higher latency yes and it also uh, it also required 25% more cpu because it was assembling and re reassembling packets now uh, how udp speeder works is it creates a tunnel between client and server and then open vpn uses that udp tunnel to create open vpn tunnel and over open vpn tunnel the traffic is uh, uh, traffic is sent now this is some mathematical black magic which i don't understand uh, so uh, Wang Yu uh, says that this is the formula to calculate post FEC packet loss. I don't know. <laughs> I, my mathematics is not very strong. I didn't pay much attention to math math teacher in my college, so I, I <laughs> so I try to play with different FEC parameters and arrive at the value which suits. Uh, on the suits the current packet loss condition right so right so uh, i packaged uh, this and pushed a pull and uh, sent a pull request to upstream and neheb had helped reviewing and hand holding while while my first pull request which was for a completely new package uh, it it went to master last week and binary packages are available in this snapshot and here is sample configuration okay security security was a low priority for our customers but yes security is always a cost center so nobody wants to invest in it anyway so open wrt firewall is already very good it is very flexible and it is also very customizable now on top of open wrt firewall uh, the package ban ip which blocks a lot of threats by using ip blacklists it creates first layer, first layer of security 
then additional layer of security is offered by DNS firewall created with adblock package which captures the DNS requests trying to escape the network and replying with NX domain for malware or suspicious domains. So this has enormously helped us and since the mm, ransomware attacks uh, uh, so to neutralize the ransomware attack, the DNS uh, DNS was the key. So out of thousand locations that we remotely managed, none of these locations got infected with any. <laughs> yeah, Janus. Janus is uh, currently not muted, but I think I could. Okay, all right. Uh, where was I? All right, so none of the thousand uh, locations that we manage, more than thousand locations that we manage, had been affected by ransomware which came over the network. Right, now the traffic which is allowed by firewall is then checked against IDS signatures uh, which are provided by emerging threats and URL house loaded onto snort. Now we could not make snort work in IPS mode and snort SAM was deprecated. Uh, so so we, uh, we wrote a small tool which monitors syslog for snort alerts and adds the offending IPs to an IP set which is, uh, which is used in firewall rules and traffic is blocked. Now we plan to package this uh, little tool and push to upstream. It also uh, clears the contract entries matching the offending IP addresses. So not only the new connections are blocked, the existing connections are also, also broken. All right, let's come to the web access control. Uh, Squid is the preferred proxy server for us, loading blacklists and keeping them updated and managing ACLs at, say, hundreds of location of, for a customer was, was a daunting task for us. Moreover, we had devices uh, which had 600 megahertz of MIP CPU and 128 MB of RAM. So loading blacklists in Squid was not at all possible. So we we came up with uh, with a Squid helper and and an ACL server, which we call Charcoal. So so the Squid proxy server sends requests to Charcoal server to request. Uh, to get allow or deny responses and we manage rules for more than thousand locations from this one interface it is free software uh, server is licensed under AGPL and helper is licensed under GPL uh, the hosted service for charcoal is also available for anyone who is interested Next is malware filtering. So to filter malware over web traffic, we use CI Cap Server, Squid Clam AV, and Clam AV, which uh, uses uh, Clam AV uh, database. And in scenarios where we do not have enough RAM on the device, we simply use URL house uh, current malware signatures. Visualization. Visualization is very important aspect uh, so that we are able to quickly spot the problem and mitigate them. Our security dashboard is created using Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Uh, 
these are some screenshots from the IDS visualization dashboard where we can see the overview the Sankey uh, chart uh, the threats and geolocation and this is this is screenshot from the web traffic visualization uh, which is self explanatory i believe now for telemetry uh, telemetry visualization we use influx db prometheus and grafana where all the devices send a telemetry data to us to our infrastructure management uh, our management infrastructure servers and yes simply looking at this telemetry data can help identify problems for example if a network generally has 5000 contract states and suddenly one day we find out okay it's 50000 then there is something abnormal happening with the traffic and then we can look at the packet dump or dig deeper to identify where the problem lies. Now, as the as our customers evolved, they started demanding more and more. So they started asking for reliability to avoid the outages due to hardware failure or a randomly hung device over the weekend. We learned to set up higher availability between two OpenWRT devices using Keep Alive D and Contract D to sync connection states. Uh, when tested, the failover is is generally within a second. And here are configuration file snippets from uh, Keep Alive D configuration file and Contract D com configuration file. All right, I can show the live uptime. All right, uh, if I do not talk about wireless, then uh, my talk should not belong to Battle of the Meshes. So Honestly speaking, wireless is not a big part of our solution, but we provided Wi-Fi APIs to a customer who wanted to cover their approximately 500,000 square, square feet of warehouse area. Uh, we use PC Engine's Alex and Qualcomm Atheros cards. We tried to deploy a layer two mesh, but we failed miserably in 2015 we were trying to use Batman. So the broadcast traffic would bring the mesh to halt. Broadcast, sorry, not the broadcast. Yeah, ARP, ARP broadcast traffic brought the mesh to the halt. So finally, we had to connect cables to each of the access points. Mm, but since then, the operation is going on 24 by 7, so we are not allowed to play again with mesh configuration so i intend to watch a recording of the talk mesh networks for beginners again and understand what were we doing wrong so the way forward from here is we want to package all the custom scripts and tools and push them to upstream we want to release a new generation charcoal which handles requests in truly asynchronous mode we are also working on building a custom firmware which focuses on security features and tools which works out of the box so that the users and community can save their time and effort that we have uh, put over the years in learning and iterating and I want to admit 
in the last that we started with uh, PF Sense in uh, 2011, but we moved to completely moved to open WRT by 2014 because uh, we were very comfortable with Linux and open WRT has everything. I look at it as a as a full fledged Linux distribution which is highly customizable and it doesn't restrict you. All right, so I would like to thank you to the lovely community at OpenWRT, organizing team at the Battle Mesh, and everyone who believes in software freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nishan, for your very interesting talk and for the, for the uh, many, many things that you presented to us with a very practical approach to what looks like managing every detail uh, of the network that you're building. Are there any questions from the audience? Please go ahead. Thanks for this impressive talk. Uh, tremendous work. Greatly done. I have just one question. How many people were involved in this in, in these five year operations of getting all that done? Uh, which five years operation? Sorry, can you please repeat again? Yeah. Uh, from the time frame you mentioned, I noticed that it is about a five to six year time frame that you worked with Open WRT. Right. So how many people were involved in getting all this done and all this deployed? Oh, well, so uh, at max, we, our team strength was four. Minimum, it was one. As of now, we have a team strength of three. Uh, so because we have automated a lot of uh, configuration changes using Ansible, uh, because OpenWisp did not cut for us. So, yeah, we have a very small team here. Okay, some people are some people are still uh, typing in the chat, so maybe we'll see another question or two. Right, I, I, I glanced through a lot of messages over, uh, according to Git, it started earlier, I don't know why, 2010. Well, all right, we have considered using WireGuard. We are experimenting with WireGuard, uh, but oh, we would certainly use WireGuard between the locations which need high throughput because currently most of the customers their VPN traffic if you had seen the graphs it didn't cross 15 Mbps so a microtech device can take 5 Mbps of AS256 GCM encrypted VPN traffic along with squid and firewall and ad block everything uh, but yes, we are trying to move to WireGuard, but OpenVPN is uh, is uh, really easy to manage as of now. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions for the speaker? Then please go forward. There were a lot of uh, discussion going on around FEC. I couldn't pay attention to them. But yes, I want to admit that FEC getting right parameters uh, for FEC is tricky when you do not know how that formula works. Right, so, so uh, generally, uh, the developer for UDP speeder he suggests that we should use 20 to 10 ratio, where for every 20 packets, 
uh, extra 10 run 10 redundant packets are sent but then that will cause us double the amount of bandwidth even without any packet loss and disabling fec at one end just simply makes it passive uh, so the other end will keep on sending redundant packets so the bandwidth at the other end will will keep on getting used so we have to find a way to automatically kick in uh, fec maybe udp speeder tunnel is there but once we see all right there is packet loss over the vpn so we can restart open vpn by making a config change using uci we change the remote endpoint and restart the open vpn so that tunnel is created over fec Thank you. And there was a question from Janos that Dango WRT just repeated. Typically, the kernel is patched from time to time. Do you patch? Well, uh, we we try to keep our releases uh, rolling with OpenWRT releases. Uh, you, you, you presented a slide and you had an uptime of about 300 days or so. So I was a little bit... Right. Uh, Asking myself, what's your strategy for for patching systems? Do you use Ubuntu Live Patch, for example, or is the, there a failover situation? What's your idea for security patches in there? Well, so we try to keep uh, rolling with OpenWRT releases, but yes, there are certain devices in the fields which cannot be remotely upgraded. For example. Uh, the Microtech devices used different uh, different file system or UBI interface. They, yeah, UBI interface. Now they can be remotely upgraded. So the devices which are in field they cannot be upgraded. We have we try to inform customers. All right, we need you may send those devices back so that we can patch uh, upgrade them with the upgradable firmware similarly with uh, x86 based uh, firmware uh, so upgrading was not possible without flashing before certain version that i am missing i do not remember the exact version number but yes you are right we are not as aggressive as we should be with upgrading the firmware versions or the kernel versions right. thank you nisha and looks like we'll have a talk from you next year where you will give more details on your update strategy right <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks for coming and yes. have a great evening um and uh, i think philippe already took the presenter rights um so let's hand over to philippe Hello. Hi, Philippe. So, thank you very much, Albert. Uh, we are now starting the Battle Mesh Community Meeting. For the ones that are uh, watching us on YouTube, we will move the discussion to the Big Blue Button instance. So, if you are watching us, uh, you can join and have this open discussion. So, we will hold for now the, the streaming and we will be back on YouTube for the farewell session. So we can continue here the discussion.
moment. No, now it's so we are again on YouTube at the moment, and we are at the farewell session. Those so this is the very end of the 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 battle match V13. We can continue the discussion after the event is officially finished. So the the room will be open if you want to continue to have some informal informal chat, but. Yeah, we wanted to to keep on the the schedule and finish uh, the event as as with as many people as as we can. So as a wrap up of of this two days edition, the thirteen edition, um, some some people say that thirteen is not a lucky number, but we managed to to do it and to make it happen in twenty twenty. We had uh, around sixty to eighty participants most of the of the time, which was uh, Quite a good surprise from for, from our perspective. Uh, we we were expecting less than fifty people, uh, so it was uh, good a good good to see that we we could exceed it most of the time. So we have all many people across the globe. The event was compiled in a very short two afternoon event, so I think it was a plus from what we could see. This was the first the first version that we have done this online. Um, we are sorry for some glitches and thank you for your patience. Uh, or sorry, your patience. Um, we tried to moderate the sessions and we got every, everyone on, on time. And our room moderators were very in a good job today. Uh, so maybe we could have a group picture at, at the very end. It would be great to make a group picture again after the, the event uh, finishes. Um, again, many thanks to all of the, the endorsers and uh, Giffinet and EXO for hosting the Big Blue Button server. Um, this was, was very important, of course. The local organizing team, uh, which is these seven guys that are behind the cameras somewhere in the world. Uh, so thank you for, for, for this long month of, of work. It's, we, we can we can say that it's easier to do it uh, as a virtual event. Of course, it's easier. We, you don't have as many logistic aspects, but uh, we, we need to th to think about if if I mean our organization pad is like fifteen pages of different meetings and uh, we, we different uh, proposals to make this happen. So it was still a, a lot of work, and, and uh, th thank you for for all of that. And finally, the, the presenters for the presentations and all of the participants. It was really great to see you all again. So stay safe and see you all in 2021. If you want to add something else for, for the audience, feel free to do it. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, maybe we can try to make a final group picture if you want. So if if you want to to open the webcam, it's okay. If you don't want, it's okay as well. Theoretically, there's a limit between fifteen and twenty cameras in Big Blue Button. Let's see if we can break this. Yesterday we were eighteen, I guess. <laughs> On the very end, we were 18. So I guess we are like almost full ready. HD? Yeah, full HD to stress the server. <laughs> how is it? How is the server holding up at the moment? High quality. Set it to high quality only. Highest quality. We should have a, a webcam pointing at the server. <laughs> but it can also be on the group picture. <laughs> you, want to, you want to capture the flames when they come. I the can camera. do screen capture, no? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Six. Ooh. See the screen? Oh. Yes. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh.
Mm. Okay. Not bad. Nothing <laughs> tops all. <odd. laughs> so how much are you using at the moment? It's 90 megabits? Yeah. Okay. Nice. If you all wave like crazy right now, it should. The thing is, like, the change. So the so that the CPU, right? Oh, it's very. Right. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Curento is a service for the screen sharing. I didn't know that is so much time con uh, CPU consuming. Wow. <laughs> So actually, if you put the screen share away, the CPU goes down, but the bandwidth stays, or is that? Huh? If the screen share is off, does yeah. the CPU goes down OK, but the bandwidth is about the same? Yeah, I think so, because the, the, the bandwidth of the screen sharing is like uh, 200 kilobits. OK. It's more expensive the um, the webcams, the video cams. Okay. Okay. If some someone else wants to join the picture, it's now or next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I want to join. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's be very professional and take a picture. <laughs> okay. On three, two, one. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. So I think this finishes the YouTube streaming and the the final farewell session. So thank you again for for attending this special thirteen edition, and see you next year. See you next year. It was great. Yeah, see you next bye. year. Bye, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. See you. See you next Thank year. You. <laughs> bye bye. See you next year. Bye bye. Bye bye.